Hey there, English learners. Welcome to our special video for English listening and speaking practice, perfect for learning while you sleep. Get ready for four hours of immersive conversation to boost your skills effortlessly. So, relax, hit play, and let the learning begin. 1. Airplane Transport and Travel Hi, I'm so excited for our trip to Paris. Me too. Have you checked in online yet? Yes, I have. But we still need to drop off our checked baggage at the baggage claim. Right. We should head to the airport early to avoid any delays. Do you have your boarding pass? Yes, I do. I printed it out at home. We just need to show it at the gate. Great. And don't forget to pack your carry-on luggage carefully. Remember, there are restrictions on liquids, aerosols, and gels, lags. I know. I've packed everything in a clear plastic bag. Have you bought any souvenirs yet? Not yet. We can check out the duty-free shop during our layover. Speaking of which, how long is our layover? It's only an hour. We'll have enough time to grab a bite to eat at the departure lounge. That sounds good. I hope there's no turbulence on our flight. Me too. But if there is, just make sure you keep your seatbelt fastened. Of course. Do you prefer a window seat, aisle seat, or middle seat? I prefer an aisle seat. What about you? I like the window seat. It's nice to look out and see the clouds. That's true. Oh, and don't forget to fill out your customs form before we land. Right. And we'll need to go through immigration and show our passport. Yes, and then we'll pick up our checked baggage at the baggage claim again. I hope our flight isn't overbooked. I don't think it is. I checked our flight number online and it looks like everything is on schedule. That's a relief. I'm looking forward to watching some in-flight entertainment. Me too. And don't worry about jet lag. We'll adjust to the new time zone soon enough. I hope so. By the way, have you bought travel insurance? Yes, I have. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Good point. And don't forget to grab a trolley for our baggage allowance. I won't. And here's our itinerary. We have a connecting flight in London before we arrive in Paris. I can't wait. This is going to be an amazing trip. I agree. Let's go make some memories. I'm so excited for our vacation. Me too. Do you have your passport? Yes, I do. But I hope we don't have any issues with customs. Don't worry. We have everything we need. And if we need help, we can always ask a flight attendant. That's true. And I hope we don't have any excess baggage. We checked the weight and size restrictions for our luggage. We should be good. Perfect. And I hope our flight isn't delayed. We booked a non-stop flight. There shouldn't be any issues. I hope we get a good seat. I prefer the window seat. I prefer the aisle seat. But don't worry, we can ask the flight attendant to help us find seats next to each other. That's true. And I hope there are good options for in-flight entertainment.
We brought books and board games. But there are also movies and TV shows on board. Awesome. And I hope we don't experience any turbulence. We checked the weather forecast. There shouldn't be any turbulence. Great. And I hope we arrive on time. We booked a round trip ticket. We should be back in time for work. That's true. I'm so excited for this trip. Me too. We're going to have a great time. And maybe that will encourage us for another travel. Speaking of another travel, I've always wanted to visit Japan. The culture and history are so fascinating. I agree. I went to Tokyo a few years ago and it was amazing. The airport terminal was so modern and efficient. That's great to hear. Did you have any trouble with customs or immigration? No, it was pretty straightforward. I had all my documents ready and the officers were very helpful. That's good to know. And what about your baggage allowance? Did you have any issues with excess baggage? No, I made sure to check the weight and size restrictions before I packed. I didn't have any problems. That's smart. And what about the boarding pass? Did you check in online or at the check-in desk? I checked in online and printed out my boarding pass at home. It was very convenient. Nice. And what about the departure lounge? Were there any good restaurants or shops? Yes, there were plenty of options. I grabbed a quick bite to eat at one of the cafes and then did some shopping at the duty-free shop. Sounds like fun. And what about the flight itself? Did you have a window seat, aisle seat, or middle seat? I had an aisle seat. It was nice to be able to stretch my legs and get up whenever I wanted. That's a good point. And what about the in-flight entertainment? Did they have any good movies or TV shows? Yes, they had a great selection. I watched a few movies and then took a nap. That sounds relaxing. And what about the flight attendant? Were they helpful? Yes, they were very friendly and attentive. They made sure everyone was comfortable and had everything they needed. That's great to hear. And what about the landing? Was it smooth or bumpy? It was a little bumpy, but nothing too bad. We landed safely and then picked up our checked baggage at the baggage claim. That's good. And what about the time zone? Did you experience any jet lag? Yes, I did. But I made sure to drink plenty of water and get some rest. I adjusted to the new time zone pretty quickly. That's good to know. And what about the return trip? Did you book a round trip ticket or a one way ticket? I booked a round trip ticket. It was more convenient and cost effective. That makes sense. And what about the travel insurance? Did you get any? Yes, I did. It's always better to be safe than sorry. That's true. And what about the travel agent? Did you use one or book everything yourself? I booked everything myself. It was pretty easy with all the online resources available. That's impressive. And what about the itinerary? Did you have everything planned out, or did you wing it? I had a general idea of what I wanted to do, but I also left some room for spontaneity. It was a good balance. That sounds like a great trip. I can't wait to visit Japan someday.
You should definitely go. It's an amazing country with so much to see and do. 2. The world's population Jane, have you ever thought about the world's population? It's fascinating to study demography. Yes, John. I heard they take a census every 10 years to keep track of the population. That's right. And the forecast shows that world population growth is on the rise. I've heard about the population explosion. Some areas are facing overpopulation and are considered to be overpopulated. Indeed. An age pyramid can show us the distribution of various age groups in a population. And factors like the birth rate, the fertility rate, and access to birth control can influence population growth. Absolutely. Making contraception available to all women can help manage population growth. But we also have to consider the death rate, the infant mortality rate, and life expectancy. True. And population density varies too. Some places are densely populated areas, while others are sparsely populated areas. The world's population continues to rise by, to increase by, or to grow by millions each year. Yes, there's been a growth in population, and in some places, it's risen dramatically. In some countries, the population has even been known to soar. In fact, the global population is expected to double in the next 50 years. And in some regions, it might even triple. Or even increase fourfold. But some estimates suggest the global population may peak at 9 billion. That's the current trend. But trends can change. Sometimes there's the reversal of a trend. Like a baby boom. After World War II, there was a significant increase in birth rates. And those born during that period are known as the baby boomers. Jane, have you ever considered how population growth affects climate change? I'm not sure, John. Can you explain? Sure. As the world's population grows, so does our demand for resources. This leads to more consumption and increased emissions of greenhouse gases. So, more people means more demand for oil, gas, coal, and other fuels that, when burned, release carbon dioxide, CO2, into the atmosphere. Exactly. And CO2 traps warm air inside like a greenhouse, contributing to global warming. I see. So, rapid population growth not only strains resources, but also exposes more people to climate-related risks. That's right. And it's not just about the number of people, but also about consumption patterns. Developed countries, for example, consume the lion's share of fossil fuels. But population growth is also happening rapidly in developing countries, right? Yes, and as these countries industrialize, their contribution to global CO2 emissions is expected to increase. So, improving access to reproductive health care, family planning options, girls' education, and gender equity are important climate mitigation strategies. Absolutely. An increased investment in health and education, along with improvements in infrastructure and land use, would strengthen climate resilience and build adaptive capacity for people around the world. Jane, do you know which countries have the most significant population growth? 
I am not sure, John. Can you tell me? Certainly. According to recent data, Syria has the highest population growth rate, with an increase of about 6.39% compared to the previous year. That's quite a lot. What about other countries? Other countries with high population growth rates include South Sudan with a growth rate of 4.78%, Niger with 3.66%, and Burundi with 3.59%. It's interesting to see how different the growth rates are across countries. Indeed. And these growth rates can have significant impacts on a country's resources, infrastructure, and environment. I can imagine. Rapid population growth can put a strain on resources and contribute to environmental issues. Exactly. That's why it's important to manage population growth responsibly and sustainably. Jane, do you know which countries are the most populated in the world? I think China and India are the most populated countries, right? Yes, you're correct. As of 2024, India is the most populated country with approximately 1.43 billion people, followed by China with about 1.43 billion. The United States is third with around 340 million people. That's a lot of people. But how is this expected to change in the future? Well, the United Nations has projected that the population of India will surpass that of China around 2024. Also, Nigeria, currently the world's seventh largest, is projected to surpass the United States and become the third largest country in the world shortly before 2050. Wow, that's a significant shift. What about other countries? From 2017 to 2050, it is expected that half of the world's population growth will be concentrated in just nine countries. India, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Pakistan, Ethiopia, the United Republic of Tanzania, the United States of America, Uganda, and Indonesia. That's interesting. So, the population growth is not evenly distributed across the globe. Exactly. And this uneven distribution of population growth presents a considerable challenge to governments in implementing sustainable development goals. 3. Sport As an athlete, you must have a deep love for sports. What drives you to compete? Well John, the thrill of the contest is what drives me. Every event is a new challenge. That's interesting. I suppose the equipment and exercise involved also contribute to your fitness. Absolutely, maintaining fitness is a goal for any athlete. It's why I joined a league. Playing in a league must be exciting. Have you won a match yet? Yes, winning is exhilarating. But dealing with officials and overtime can be challenging. I can imagine. How do you prepare for a performance? I practice regularly, John. It's the best way to improve my record and enjoy my recreation time. That's dedication. Do you plan to retire from sports anytime soon? Not at all, John. I still have many scores to settle. That's the spirit of sportsmanship. Do you play as part of a team? Yes, we often play at different venues. It's a great way to meet new people. And how does it feel to win after a tough workout? 
Winning feels rewarding, especially after a tough workout. It's why I love sports. Do you also go to a fitness center to keep fit? Yes, it's a great way to improve my fitness, age well, and keep slim. You seem to be quite keen on sport. Do you exercise regularly? Yes, I try to be sporty and exercise regularly. It's part of being a sports buff. You seem to be obsessed with sport. It's a big part of your life, isn't it? Yes, John. I'm obsessed with sport. It's a big part of my life. Jane, we've talked a lot about your personal experience with sports. Can you share some of the positive impacts of practicing sports? Absolutely, John. Practicing sports has numerous benefits. Firstly, it improves physical health and fitness. Regular exercise can help maintain a healthy weight, reduce the risk of heart disease, and improve overall body function. That's true. I've also heard that sports can have mental benefits as well. Is that correct? Yes, John. Sports can help reduce stress, improve mood, and boost self-confidence. It can also improve sleep patterns and increase concentration and mental alertness. It sounds like sports can really improve one's quality of life. Are there any social benefits as well? Definitely, John. Sports can help build teamwork and leadership skills. It also provides opportunities to meet new people and build friendships. Plus, it's a great way to have fun and enjoy recreational time. Wow, Jane. The benefits of sports are truly extensive. It's not just about winning or losing, but about overall well-being. Exactly, John. That's why I'm so passionate about sports. It's not just a hobby, but a lifestyle that promotes health, happiness, and community. Jane, you've shared a lot about your personal experience with sports. I'm curious, how do people practice sports in different countries? That's a great question, John. Sports practices can vary greatly from country to country. For example, in Brazil, Football is more than just a sport. It's a part of their culture and is played everywhere, from beaches to favelas. That's fascinating. What about countries like India? In India, cricket is incredibly popular. People often gather in open spaces to play. It's common to see impromptu matches in parks, streets, and even between neighborhoods. And what about countries with colder climates, like Canada? In Canada, ice hockey is a major sport. Many Canadians grow up learning to skate and play hockey on frozen ponds and rinks. It's a sport that really embraces the country's cold winters. It's interesting to see how geography and culture can influence the sports people play. What about individual sports? Individual sports also vary by country. In Japan, martial arts like judo and karate are very popular. In the US, people are keen on fitness and you'll find many who enjoy workouts at the gym. It seems like sports really are a universal language, even though the dialects may differ. Absolutely, John. No matter where you go, you'll find people who are passionate about sports. It's a wonderful way to connect with others and learn about different cultures. Jane, we've talked about how sports are practiced in different countries. Can you tell me about the most practiced sports in the world by individual people? Certainly, John. Association Football 
or soccer, is the most popular sport globally, with about 4 billion fans and an estimated 270 million players. It's a team sport with the highest number of participants in the world. That's impressive. What other sports are popular worldwide? Cricket is another sport that's widely played, especially in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Australia. In North America, American football is popular in the US, while ice hockey is big in Canada. What about individual sports? Are there any that stand out? Yes, golf is quite popular, with an estimated fan base of about 450 million people worldwide. It's most prevalent in North America, Western Europe, and East Asia. It's fascinating to see how sports can bring people together from all walks of life. Absolutely, John. Sports are a universal language that can bridge cultural and geographical divides. It's one of the many reasons why I love being involved in sports. 4. Food Jane, have you ever tried gourmet cooking? It's a culinary art that can really gratify the palate. I haven't. John. But I've heard it can create some mouth-watering dishes. I'd love to savor the flavors of different cuisines. Absolutely, the delectable tastes and aromas mingle together to create an exquisite experience. And it's even better when the ingredients are sustainable. That sounds divine, John. I've heard that umami is a flavor that gourmet chefs often try to achieve. Yes, and they often use techniques like simmering to infuse flavors and create a pleasing mouthfeel. A hearty stew, for example, can be made more robust by simmering the ingredients together. And what about textures, John? I love a crunchy salad with crisp vegetables. Texture is important too, Jane. A tender steak or a crispy piece of fried chicken can be just as satisfying as the flavors themselves. I agree, John. And I love to saute vegetables. It brings out a piquant flavor that's really enjoyable. Absolutely, Jane. And there's nothing like the sizzling sound of food in a hot pan. It's a wholesome experience. I also love the aromatic smells that come from cooking. It's like getting a scoop of the meal before you even taste it. Yes, and whether the flavors are mild or strong, it's always a pleasure to indulge in a well-cooked meal. I couldn't agree more, John. And I love to stir fry. The quick cooking process helps the flavors to mingle. And don't forget about the sour and tangy flavors, Jane. They can really add a zesty kick to a dish. Absolutely, John. And I love a good braise. The slow cooking process makes the meat so succulent. Yes. And the sear on a piece of meat can add so much crispness. It's a divine contrast to the tender interior. And the garnish on a dish can add so much, John. It's like the finishing touch. Absolutely, Jane. Every mouthful should be a delight. And the sizzle of a dish as it's served can really make your mouth water. I agree, John. And I think it's important that our food is sustainable. It's better for us and for the planet. Absolutely, Jane. A well-seasoned dish that's mouth-watering and sustainable is the ultimate goal. Jane, have you ever tried any exotic cuisines from different countries? I have, John. I've tried Italian cuisine, 
which is known for its hearty pasta dishes and zesty sauces. That sounds delicious, Jane. I've tried Japanese cuisine. The sustainable sushi and crisp tempura are truly mouth-watering. I've heard about that, John. And what about Indian cuisine? The aromatic spices and robust flavors really infuse the dishes. Absolutely, Jane. The sizzling curries and tangy chutneys are a delight to the palate. And the stir-fry techniques used in Chinese cuisine are also quite fascinating. I agree, John. The crispy spring rolls and succulent dumplings are a real treat. And let's not forget about Mexican cuisine, with its piquant salsas and crunchy tacos. Yes, Jane. The meld of flavors in a good taco is truly divine. And the garnish of fresh herbs adds a nice touch. I couldn't agree more, John. Each cuisine has its own unique mouthfeel and flavors that gratify the senses. Absolutely, Jane. It's a joy to indulge in the diverse cuisines of the world. Each mouthful is an adventure. Well said, John. Exploring different cuisines is like taking a culinary journey around the world. Jane, my favorite cuisine has to be Italian. The hearty pasta dishes, crisp pizzas, and exquisite gelato really gratify my palate. The way the flavors mingle in a simple yet delectable spaghetti aglio e olio is just divine. That sounds wonderful, John. As for me, I'm a big fan of Thai cuisine. The zesty tom yum soup, succulent pad thai, and aromatic green curry are truly mouth-watering. I love how they infuse herbs and spices to create such robust flavors. Thai cuisine sounds exotic, Jane. I've heard their use of umami flavors is quite unique. Absolutely, John. And the sizzle of a hot plate of pad kra pao is enough to make anyone's mouth water. It's a wholesome experience. I'll have to try it sometime, Jane. Exploring different cuisines is like a culinary adventure. I couldn't agree more, John. It's a joy to savor the diverse flavors of the world. Jane, have you ever tried any diet cuisines? They can be quite wholesome and satisfying. Yes, John. I've tried the Mediterranean diet. It's known for its sustainable ingredients like olive oil, fresh fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins. It's a mouth-watering and healthy choice. That sounds exquisite, Jane. I've heard that the flavors really mingle well in Mediterranean dishes. And the crisp salads and tender grilled fish are quite delectable. Absolutely, John. And the aromatic herbs used in the cuisine add a zesty touch. It's a great way to indulge in good food while staying healthy. I agree, Jane. I've tried the paleo diet. It focuses on hearty meats, fruits, and vegetables, and avoids processed foods. The robust flavors and crunchy textures are truly gratifying. That sounds divine, John. And it's great that these diets not only focus on taste, but also on health. It's a sizzling trend in the culinary world. Absolutely, Jane. And the best part is, these diets don't make you give up on taste. Every mouthful is a delight. Well said, John. Eating healthy doesn't mean you have to compromise on taste. It's all about finding the right balance. 
Jane, about paleo, have you heard about the paleo diet? It's based on the eating habits of our ancestors from the Paleolithic era, which was before the advent of agriculture. I've heard of it, John. Isn't it also known as the caveman diet, or the hunter-gatherer diet? That's right, Jane. The paleo diet includes lean meats, fish, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, foods that in the past could be obtained by hunting and gathering. So, it excludes foods that became common when farming emerged, like dairy products, legumes, and grains. Exactly, Jane. The idea is that the human body is genetically mismatched to the modern diet that emerged with farming practices. Farming changed what people ate and established dairy, grains, and legumes as additional staples in the human diet. That's interesting, John. But isn't it challenging to follow such a diet in today's times? It can be, Jane. But the focus is on eating whole, unprocessed foods. And while it does restrict certain food groups, it doesn't require counting calories or macronutrients. Sounds like a sustainable and healthy approach to eating, John. I might give it a try. That's the spirit, Jane. Remember, it's not just about losing weight but also about leading a healthier lifestyle. 5. Shopping Part 1 Hi Jane, I'm planning to go to the shopping mall today. I have a shopping list and a budget. Would you like to join me? Sure, John. I have a gift card and some coupons. Maybe we can find a bargain. That sounds great. I'm looking for a brand with good quality merchandise. I hope the store has a good inventory. Don't forget to check the price tag and label for information. And remember, if you pay by credit card, you might get a discount. Good point. I'll also check the warranty and ask for a receipt. If there's a problem, I can request a refund or an exchange. Yes, and if you're unsure about the size or color, use the fitting room. The shop assistant can help you. I'll remember that. I'll also check the sale items on the shelf and rack. Maybe I'll find something nice. And don't forget to check the exchange rate if you're buying from an international vendor or supplier. Right. I'll also consider online shopping. I can read reviews and compare retail and wholesale prices. Just be aware of the delivery costs and tax. And remember to take a shopping bag or use a cart at the checkout. Thanks for the advice. Jane. I'll keep an eye out for the store's slogan and logo. It's part of the shopping experience. You're welcome, John. Enjoy your shopping. Jane, I've been thinking about the differences between online shopping and shopping at a physical store. What are your thoughts? Well, John, both have their pros and cons. Online shopping can be more convenient. You can shop from the comfort of your home, read customer reviews, and easily compare prices. That's true. Plus, online stores often have a wider inventory. But I guess the downside is that you can't try on clothes or see the quality of the merchandise firsthand. Exactly, John. That's where physical stores have an advantage. You can touch and feel the products, try them on, and even get advice from a shop assistant. 
Yes, and you also get the product immediately after purchase, no need to wait for delivery. But then, there's the effort of going to the market or shopping mall, which can be time-consuming. True, John. And with physical stores, there's no need to worry about exchange rates or international suppliers. Everything is local. I see. It seems like the choice between online and physical shopping depends on what you value more, convenience and variety, or the ability to see and try products before buying. Absolutely, John. It's all about what works best for the consumer. And remember, whether you're shopping online or in a store, it's important to be a smart customer. Jane, you mentioned being a smart consumer. What does that mean exactly? Well, John, a smart consumer makes informed decisions. They consider the quality of the merchandise, compare prices, read reviews, and understand the store's return and refund policies. I see. And they probably also consider their budget and avoid impulsive buying, right? Absolutely, John. It's also important to keep track of your purchases. Always ask for a receipt and check it against your credit card or debit card statement. That makes sense. But how can I know if an online store is trustworthy? Good question, John. Look for secure payment options, read the store's privacy policy, and check if the site has a secure connection, the URL should start with HTTPS. I'll keep that in mind. And I guess checking customer reviews and ratings can also give an idea about the store's reliability. Yes, John. But be cautious, as some reviews might be fake. It's always a good idea to check multiple sources and use your judgment. Thanks for the advice, Jane. I feel more confident about being a smart consumer now. You're welcome, John. Happy shopping. Jane, I've heard about scams when shopping online. What should I be aware of? Great question, John. One common scam is fake online stores. They may have very low prices to lure customers, but they don't deliver the products after payment. That sounds terrible. How can I avoid it? Always check the credibility of the online store. Look for customer reviews, secure payment options, and a clear return policy. Be wary if the prices seem too good to be true. Got it. Any other scams I should know about? Yes, be careful with phishing emails. Scammers send emails pretending to be from a reputable online store or your bank, asking you to update your payment details. That's scary. How can I protect myself? Never click on links in unsolicited emails. Always go directly to the website by typing the URL in your browser. And remember, no reputable company will ask for your password or credit card details via email. Thanks for the advice, Jane. I'll be more cautious when shopping online. You're welcome, John. Remember, being a smart consumer means being a safe consumer. 6. At the office? Hey Sarah, have you seen the latest memo on the vacant positions in our department? There's talk about a corporate takeover bid. Oh, really? I just loaded the latest software update. We might need it with all these changes coming up. Good call. The CEO mentioned a commercial survey to assess our department's expenditures and earnings. 
It's vital for handling our budget efficiently. I heard they're considering a new executive to head the department. Do you think it's related to the recent dismissals? Yeah, they had to fire some employees due to a decline in the turnover. It's affecting everyone. I've been updating guidelines to streamline processes. I noticed a notice about a leave request in the inbox. We need to process it promptly to avoid overdue assignments. Definitely. I have a deadline to complete the survey, but the intern is still working on the survey forms. We should forward it to speed things up. I'll take on that task. Also, have you checked the drawer for the stationary supplies? We're running low on essential items. Not yet. I'll do that after I cancel the outdated assignments in the system. We can't afford any data processing errors. True. And don't forget to pick up the shipment of office supplies later. We're entitled to those as part of the corporate benefits. I have a chart detailing the department's skill distribution. We should launch a training session for employees to improve their skills. Great idea. I have a draft for a flyer promoting the new training position. Once approved, we can launch it to attract potential candidates. Let's staple the survey forms to the booklet about the department's achievements. It'll make a strong case for our team during the takeover bid. Agreed. I'll also delete outdated files from the directory and create a new folder for the latest data. We need everything organized for the bid. Perfect. And be sure to update the CEO on our progress. A well-prepared presentation will strengthen our position in the upcoming negotiations. Speaking of presentations, have you seen the new guidelines for creating effective corporate presentations? I found a booklet in the executive's office. No, I haven't. It's crucial to be well prepared for the CEO's attention. Let's make sure we follow the guidelines to enhance our chances. I've also been working on a chart outlining the department's expenditures and how we plan to improve them. It's essential for our financial handling. Good thinking. We need solid data for the upcoming board meeting. By the way, did you hear about the new employee taking on the position in the marketing department? Yes, I did. They sent out a notice about it. I think they're attached to a previous project, but they have the skills needed for the job. That's promising. We can collaborate with them on the survey and bid projects. It might speed up the process and improve the overall quality. Agreed. Let's also check if there's a deadline for the takeover bid. We don't want to be overdue with our preparations. Absolutely. I'll handle the filing of necessary documents in the binder. We need everything in order, especially with the CEO closely monitoring our progress. And, John, don't forget about the retirement party for our colleague. We should update the directory and send out a notice about the celebration. Right, I almost forgot. It's essential to recognize their contributions. I'll take care of the retirement details and make sure it's a memorable event. Great. It seems we have a lot on our plates. But with effective communication and teamwork, we can successfully navigate through these office challenges. Absolutely. Let's continue to handle each task efficiently and keep the head of the department updated on our progress. This way, we'll contribute to the overall success of the company. Before we wrap up, there's an urgent matter, an overdue assignment for the survey. 
We need to process it immediately to meet the tight deadline. Oh, I missed that. Thanks for catching it. I'll forward it to the intern, and we'll work together to complete it swiftly. Also, I received a takeover bid document. It's a crucial assignment, and we should assign someone with the right skill set to handle it. Agreed. I'll take it on. I have experience in dealing with takeover bids, and it aligns with my expertise in data processing. Perfect. I'll update the software to ensure it's compatible with the latest guidelines for handling such bids. Efficiency is key here. While you're at it, check if the CEO has any specific directives on the bid. It's essential to follow the guidelines to the letter. Definitely. I'll also go through the income and expenditures files to create a detailed report for the board. Accuracy is crucial in financial matters. And, Sarah, don't forget to pick up the necessary supplies for the office. We can't afford any interruptions in our workflow due to shortages. True, I'll add that to my to-do list. Lastly, have you seen the directory lately? I noticed some outdated information that needs deletion. No, but I'll make sure to check it after I complete the takeover bid assignment. Let's keep our department organized and efficient. Agreed. With our combined efforts, we'll not only meet the deadlines but also elevate the performance of our department. We've got this, John. Absolutely, Sarah. Let's continue working together seamlessly, and we'll navigate through these office challenges successfully. Sounds like a plan, Sarah. Let's tackle these tasks and meet back later to ensure everything is on track. Agreed, John. I'll update the software, process the overdue assignment, and handle the office supplies. Let's reconvene in the afternoon. Perfect. I'll focus on the takeover bid, check the directory, and complete the filing. We'll regroup and update each other on the progress. Excellent. Until then, John, take care of those tasks, and let's make sure our department shines during the upcoming challenges. Will do, Sarah. Good luck with your assignments, and we'll catch up later. Thanks, John. Goodbye for now, and let's make today a productive one. Goodbye, Sarah. Let's do this. Seven City and Urban Life Hi Jane, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks for asking. How about you? I'm doing all right, but I'm feeling a bit stressed out lately. Oh no, what's been causing your stress? Well, I've been struggling to afford the cost of living in the city. Everything is so expensive, from housing to food to transportation. I know what you mean. Public transportation is not always accessible or affordable, which makes it hard to get around. Exactly. And the lack of diversity in some neighborhoods can lead to segregation and inequality. That's true. And sometimes, urban sprawl and gentrification can lead to the displacement of marginalized communities. Yes, and the environmental impact of urbanization can be devastating. Pollution and noise pollution are major problems in many cities. Absolutely. And the lack of open space and green areas can lead to feelings of isolation and loneliness. It's a shame that we don't have more amenities like libraries and parks to promote socialization and diversity of thought. I agree. 
and the stress of living in a metropolis or megacity can lead to anime and other mental health issues. It's a complex problem, but I think urban planning can play a role in promoting sustainability and livability. Definitely. And we need to work together to address issues like housing segregation, traffic, and the impact of skyscrapers on the environment. It's a big challenge, but I'm hopeful that we can make a difference. Me too. Thanks for the conversation, Joan. Anytime, Jane. Take care. By the way, have you ever been to a shantytown? No, I haven't. What's it like? It's a slum area where people live in makeshift houses made of scrap materials. They don't have access to basic amenities like clean water, sanitation, or electricity. That sounds terrible. Is there anything we can do to help? There are many organizations that work to improve the living conditions of people in shanty towns. We can donate money or volunteer our time to support their efforts. That's a great idea. I'll look into it. Also, have you noticed how noisy the city can be sometimes? Yes, noise pollution is a major problem in many urban areas. It can be really stressful. I find that listening to music or wearing noise-canceling headphones can help. That's a good tip. I'll have to try that. And what about air pollution? Have you ever experienced any health problems because of it? Not yet, but I know that air pollution can cause respiratory problems and other health issues. It's a serious problem that needs to be addressed. We need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and promote sustainable transportation options. Absolutely. And we also need to make sure that everyone has access to affordable health care. Yes, healthcare is a basic human right that should be available to everyone, regardless of their income or social status. But you know some people love city life. Yeah, some people think cities are expensive, but other find them actually pretty affordable. I agree. They says that there are so many different neighborhoods with different price points, so you can find something that fits your budget. And the diversity is amazing. There are so many different cultures and backgrounds represented here. That's true. Some people think that it's really cool to be able to learn about different cultures just by walking around the city. And they put forward public transportation, it can be so convenient. You don't even need a car to get around. Definitely. Some people love being able to take the subway or bus wherever they need to go. And there's always something to do, so you never get bored. The amenities are amazing. Yes, there are so many great restaurants, museums, and parks to explore. And the socialization is great too. You can meet so many interesting people just by going out and exploring the city. That's true. And the diversity of thought is really refreshing. You're exposed to so many different ideas and perspectives. And the innovation is amazing. There are so many startups and new businesses popping up all the time. Definitely. It's exciting to be a part of a city that's always changing and growing. And the social mobility is great too. There are so many opportunities to succeed and move up in the world. That's true. And the livability is great too. Despite the hustle and bustle, cities can be very livable. And the sustainability is important too. Cities can be leaders in environmental protection and conservation. Absolutely. And while there are some downsides to city life, like pollution and stress, I think the positives far outweigh the negatives. 
I agree. So there are also advantages to city life. Exact. In fact, each person can choose according to their tastes. And the perception of advantages and disadvantages may differ for each person. We must therefore respect everyone's choices. 8. At the hotel, Hi Jane, I've been thinking about our long journey and I believe we should book a stay at a hotel. What do you think? That sounds like a great idea, John. Do you have any particular hotel in mind? Yes, I've heard rave reviews about this brand new boutique hotel. It's slap bang in the middle of all the attractions and just a stone's throw away from the beach. They have a variety of amenities that could make our stay comfortable and memorable. That sounds out of this world. What amenities do they offer? They offer a complimentary breakfast, Wi-Fi, a mini bar in every room, and even an ice machine on every floor. Plus, they have a restaurant with an a la carte menu. The restaurant is known for its exquisite cuisine and has been attracting food lovers from all over the world. That sounds fantastic. I'd love to get pampered after our long journey. Do they have room service? Yes, they do. And the best part is that they have a resort and changing facilities too. You can splash out and enjoy your stay. The resort has a beautiful view and is equipped with all the modern facilities. It's the perfect place to relax and rejuvenate. That's great. But what about the rooms? I hope they are comfortable. Absolutely. They have double beds with the softest sheets, and the housekeeping service is top-notch. You can even request a cot or a rollaway bed if needed. The rooms are spacious and well-lit, with a soothing decor that would make you feel at home. Sounds perfect. But I hope there are no hidden costs. No, everything is transparent. But they do require a deposit, and there could be a damage charge if we cause any harm to the room. They believe in maintaining a high standard of service and expect their guests to respect the property. That's fair. And what about the reservation process? It's quite simple. We can book our stay directly from their website. They even have adjoining rooms if we need more space. The booking process is user-friendly and they have a dedicated customer service team to assist you in case you face any issues. That's convenient. And I assume they have vacancies? Yes, they do. But we should book soon. They're quite popular and get booked fast. The hotel manager ensures that the guests have a pleasant stay and personally looks into the reservations. All right, let's do it. And remember to tip the bellboy when we arrive with our baggage. Of course, Jane. I'll play it by ear and make sure our stay is as comfortable as possible. The bellboy is always ready to assist with the baggage and the front desk is manned round the clock to cater to the needs of the guests. I'm sure we'll have a great time. Jane, I forgot to mention the price and cancellation policy. Would you like to know about that? Yes, John. That's important information. How much does it cost per night? The price varies depending on the type of room and the season. But generally, it's quite reasonable considering the amenities and the location. They also offer discounts for longer stays. That sounds good. And what if we need to cancel our reservation for some reason? They do have a cancellation policy in place. 
If we cancel our reservation 48 hours before our check-in date, we can get a full refund. However, if we cancel within 48 hours, they will charge a cancellation fee. That seems fair. It's always good to have flexibility, especially when we're traveling. Absolutely, Jane. I'll make sure to check all the details before making the reservation. We want our stay to be as smooth and enjoyable as possible. Thank you, John. I appreciate your effort. I'm looking forward to our stay at the hotel. Jane, I just realized we've been using the terms hotel and in interchangeably. Do you know the difference between the two? I'm not entirely sure, John. I've always thought they were the same. Well, traditionally, a hotel is considered to be an establishment in the middle of town that offers accommodations and extensive amenities. They are usually located in cities, sports sites, vacation sites, and business districts. Hotels can accommodate a large number of people and have a variety of room types. They also offer long-term services, making them suitable for both short and long-term stays. I see. And what about an inn? An inn, on the other hand, is a smaller, more intimate establishment that offers lodging and food, typically in a rural location. They are usually located along highways. Inns are generally less costly than hotels and are considered less luxurious. They provide a cozier, more personalized experience. A true inn is far more likely than a hotel to be a quaint, single building location with a limited selection of rooms and a singular option for in-house dining. That's interesting. So, the hotel we're booking, is it more of a hotel or an inn? It's definitely more of a hotel. It's located in the city, offers a wide range of amenities, and can accommodate a large number of guests. But it also strives to provide a personalized experience, much like an inn. Thanks for explaining, John. It's good to know the difference. 9. Getting around Hey Taylor, I'm feeling a bit adventurous today. How do you reckon we get to that new exhibition downtown? Aw, the museum, right? It's a bit of a pickle because of the ongoing construction. I suggest we jump in a cab and brave the traffic. True, it can be hectic this time of day. Is it far from here? Not too bad. We can skirt the main roads, take the ring road, and avoid the snarl up. Sounds good. Any chance for a shortcut? Well, there's an alleyway that could cut through, but it's a bit of a shortcut, and it might get crowded. Let's play it safe and go the long way round then. What's our best bet? Your best bet is to follow the signs for the park. We can double back on ourselves and pop down the scenic river route. Nice plan. But what if we end up in a dead end? Unlikely. I know the area well. We'll bear left at the junction and cross over the bridge. Fantastic. Anything iconic near the museum? Keep an eye out for the tall tower. It's a landmark. We'll walk along the stylish sidewalk. Hard to miss. Excellent. If we run into any trouble, what's the backup plan? We'll steer clear of the one-way streets and back roads. Don't worry, we'll navigate smoothly. And if we miss a turn? No sweat. We can always make a U-turn at the next junction. Easy peasy. You're the best navigator, Taylor.
Ready for this urban adventure? Absolutely, Alex. Keep going straight, cross over the zebra crossing, and the museum will be right in front of us. Thanks for the detailed guide, Taylor. Let's hit the road. Speaking of navigating, I had this crazy experience once in Paris. It was my first time in the City of Lights, and I thought I could just rely on my sense of direction. Paris? The city with all those winding streets? That sounds like a challenge. Oh, it was more than a challenge. I decided to take what seemed like a shortcut through an alleyway, thinking I could skirt the crowded main roads. Brave move. How did it turn out? A bit of a pickle, actually. I got completely turned around, and before I knew it, I was deep into a maze of one-way streets. Yikes. That must have been stressful. You have no idea. I kept trying to double back on myself, but every corner seemed to lead me to another dead end. I felt like I was in a never-ending snarl-up. Parisian streets can be tricky like that. Absolutely. I finally decided to pop into a cafe, ask for directions, and maybe a bit of comfort food to ease the situation. Good call. How did you end up finding your way? Well, the locals were friendly and pointed me in the right direction. I had to bear left at a junction, cross over a charming bridge, and finally, there it was, the Eiffel Tower. The ultimate Parisian landmark. What an adventure. I guess sometimes, going the long way around is the best option. Definitely learned my lesson that day. Now, whenever I'm in a new city, I make sure to follow the signs and avoid those tempting but confusing shortcuts. You know, Alex, I was just thinking about driving in different countries. Have you ever experienced the switch from left-hand driving to right-hand driving, or vice versa? Absolutely. It can be quite an adjustment. I remember traveling to the UK, and suddenly everything felt reversed, from steering on the other side to driving on the left. That must have been a bit of a pickle. How did you handle it? It was tricky at first. I had to consciously remind myself to bear left at junctions and cross over traffic coming from the right. The roundabouts were especially challenging. I can imagine. Did you find it safer or more confusing? Well, it's hard to say. Once you get used to it, it becomes the new norm. But at first, I was constantly checking the mirrors and hesitating at turns. It felt like I had to double back on my driving instincts. Interesting. I've only driven in countries with right-hand traffic. I wonder how challenging it is for those who regularly switch between left and right driving. It's a good point. Some countries, like Australia and India, have a mix of both. I guess you're best off getting accustomed to it gradually. Right. I've heard stories about tourists mistakenly driving on the wrong side in unfamiliar countries. It happens more often than you'd think. I remember a friend accidentally turning onto a one-way street in Japan, they had to turn back quickly. That sounds like a nerve-wracking experience. What about road signs? Did they play a role in helping you navigate the different driving norms? Absolutely. The signs are your best bet. They provide crucial information and reminders about which side of the road to stay on. It's fascinating how something as basic as traffic direction can vary worldwide. Makes you appreciate the importance of following the rules wherever you are. Totally. It's a crucial aspect of travel, 
and adapting to different driving styles adds an extra layer of adventure to exploring new places. 10 Time Management Hey Sarah, how are you doing? I'm good, John. How about you? I'm doing well too. I've been trying to manage my time better lately. I've realized that I'm more of a night owl and I tend to be more productive at night. But I also need to be mindful of my curfew. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'm more of a morning person myself. I like to get up early and get things done. But I also like to have some time off to relax and recharge. That's a good point. I think it's important to find a balance between work and play. Speaking of which, have you been to any good nightlife spots lately? Not really. I've been trying to focus on my time management skills and get more done during the day. I've been using some time management tools to help me stay on track. That's a great idea. I've been using a similar tool to help me with time tracking. It's been really helpful in identifying where I'm spending too much time. Yeah, I think it's important to be aware of how you're spending your time. Especially when you're under a time crunch. Absolutely. I've had a few deadline extensions lately, but I don't want to rely on them too much. I need to work on my procrastination. I know what you mean. It's easy to get distracted and put things off. But I find that having a schedule helps me stay on track. Yeah, I need to work on being more punctual too. I'm always running late and it stresses me out. I hear you. I think it's important to be respectful of other people's home time too. Like if you need to drop somebody home, you should try to do it as soon as possible. That's a good point. I don't want to keep people waiting. Speaking of which, I should probably head back soon. I have a late finish tonight. No problem. Let's aim to meet up again soon. Maybe we can grab a coffee or something. Sounds good to me. I'll try to be up early tomorrow so we can make it happen. Don't worry about it. I don't mind if you need to get a lie-in. We have a couple of hours before I need to get home. Thanks, Sarah. You're the best. I always feel so groggy in the morning. No problem, John. I know how you feel. I used to be a late riser too. But I find that if I stay up too late, I end up feeling tired the next day. Yeah, I know what you mean. I always yawn during meetings if I don't get enough sleep. Well, you should try to get up earlier and see if it makes a difference. Who knows, you might become an early riser like me. I'll give it a shot. Thanks for the advice, Sarah. You're always so helpful. Anytime, John. That's what friends are for. Remember, don't bank on getting a deadline extension all the time. It's better to work hard and meet the deadline. 11 Travel Problems Alex, I can't believe the series of problems we've encountered during this trip. I know, right? It's been one thing after another. What happened? First, I had to change my ticket because of a family emergency, 
and then there was a delay that made me miss my connecting flight. That's rough. I had my own set of issues. I got sick after eating some street food at the layover. Oh no, that's terrible. Did you see a doctor? Not yet, but I bought some medicine at the airport pharmacy. Hopefully, it helps. Smart move. I had my own scare when I realized I forgot my passport at home. Seriously? How did you manage that? I was so focused on packing that it completely slipped my mind. I only realized it when I reached the security checkpoint. Yikes. What did you do? Thankfully, they let me reschedule for a later flight after I explained the situation. But I had to pay a fine at customs for bringing in some prohibited items. Prohibited items? What did you have? Apparently, the souvenir I bought had animal products. I had no idea. And the language barrier didn't help when I tried to explain. That's crazy. I had my own language barrier moment when I arrived in China. No one spoke English at the local clinic when I needed a prescription. It's a struggle. And then, to top it off, my luggage got lost. I had to wait for hours to claim it. Lost luggage? That's the worst. Did they find it? Eventually, but it was such a hassle. I made a complaint, and they offered a refund for the inconvenience. That's something, at least. I had my fair share of issues too. I fell victim to a scam while exchanging currency at a local vendor. Really? What happened? They gave me less money than I should have received. I didn't notice until later. Always double check. Agreed. On a positive note, I managed to upgrade to a better seat on my rescheduled flight. Nice. I got downgraded because of a technical issue with my original seat. They compensated me, but still, it's frustrating. Traveling can be so unpredictable. You never know what you're going to face. I even had to quarantine for 14 days upon arrival. Quarantine? That sounds tough. It was but I took the time to rest and recover. How about you? Any plans now? I'll see a doctor first and then probably explore the city during the remaining days of my trip. Make the most of a bad situation, right? Absolutely. And let's hope the rest of our travels are smooth sailing. No more surprises. Agreed. Fingers crossed for a drama-free journey from here on out. Speaking of drama, have you ever experienced a layover this long? I had one in Dubai, and it felt like an eternity. Oh, absolutely. My layover in Singapore once lasted almost a day. I decided to take advantage of it and had a mini stopover to explore the city. That sounds like a silver lining. Mine was just endless waiting. Waiting, I can handle. It's the unexpected expenses that get me. I had to shell out extra for an unplanned hotel stay during that Singapore layover. Ugh, tell me about it. I had to spend a night at a hotel when my flight got cancelled due to bad weather. The airline offered a voucher, but it wasn't enough. Weather can be a game changer. I once had a flight delay due to a snowstorm. It led to a domino effect, and I missed my connection. Snowstorms are tricky. 
I had a friend who got stuck in one and had to endure a 12 hour layover. 12 hours? That's brutal. Did they at least offer compensation? They did, but it was a battle to get it. The airline claimed it was beyond their control. Classic. Remember the volcano eruption that grounded flights a few years ago? Talk about unexpected chaos. Absolutely. People were stranded everywhere. I heard some travelers had to resort to creative ways to continue their journey. Like what? Some chartered boats, others shared rental cars to get to their destinations. It was a real adventure. Desperate times call for desperate measures, I guess. But let's not forget the positive moments. Ever had an unexpected friendship blossom during a layover or delay? Funny you mention it. During that Dubai layover, I met a fellow traveler who shared my passion for photography. We explored the city together and are still friends today. That's the beauty of travel, finding connections in the most unexpected places. It almost makes up for the travel woes. Exactly. So, here's to hoping for more pleasant surprises and fewer travel hiccups in the future. Cheers to that. May our next journeys be filled with smooth flights, on-time arrivals, and new friendships along the way. 12 Studies Hey Alex, how's it going? Hey Emily. Not bad, just buried under a pile of assignments. You know how it is. Totally get it. What are you majoring in again? I'm majoring in computer science. It's challenging, but I love it. How about you? Nice. I'm majoring in psychology. It's fascinating to dive into the human mind and behavior. That sounds cool. Any particular area in psychology you're focusing on? I'm leaning towards cognitive psychology. The way people process information and solve problems just intrigues me. Impressive choice. I'm knee deep in coding right now. Just finished a project on machine learning. It was intense but rewarding. Wow, machine learning sounds complex. I'm still grappling with statistical analysis in my research methods class. Trust me, coding has its moments too. Anyway, any exciting plans for the weekend? Not really. I have a term paper to finish. The joys of academia, right? True that. I might join a hackathon at the campus tech club. It's a good break from the regular grind. Sounds fun. I'll stick to my books for now. By the way, have you decided on your minor? I'm thinking of minoring in business. A bit of a contrast, but I believe it could open up some interesting career paths. Smart move. I'm considering a minor in Spanish. Always wanted to be bilingual. Impressive. Two languages and coding? You're on fire. Huh, trying to keep things interesting. How about you? Any language skills in your arsenal? Sadly, no. Coding languages are my only forte for now. But hey, never say never. Absolutely. Well, I better get back to my statistics book. Good luck with your hackathon, Alex. Thanks, Emily. Best of luck with your paper. Let's catch up soon. 
By the way, did you catch Professor Johnson's lecture yesterday? Yeah, that was intense. I had to rewatch the recording to fully grasp some of the concepts. Totally. His classes are challenging, but I appreciate the depth of knowledge we gain. Speaking of professors, have you met Dr. Rodriguez? He's my advisor for the Computer Science Club. Not yet. How is he as an advisor? Fantastic. He's been really supportive, especially with our coding projects. Have you made any new friends in your major? Yeah, a few. We formed a study group for the last programming assignment, and it made a huge difference. Nice. I've been collaborating with a few classmates for a research project. It's great to share ideas. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? How's life in the psychology department? Any interesting events or talks? Well, we had a guest speaker last week discussing the latest breakthroughs in behavioral psychology. It was eye-opening. That sounds fascinating. Maybe I should attend more events outside of the computer science bubble. How are you finding the campus atmosphere lately? It's vibrant, especially with the upcoming sports events. Are you planning to attend the basketball game this Friday? I heard it's a big rivalry match. Definitely wouldn't miss it. Have you tried the new dishes at the cafeteria? Yeah, they introduced some international cuisine. The spicy Thai noodles are surprisingly good. I'll have to give them a try. I've been living on pizza and energy drinks lately. By the way, how's life in the university dorms? It's not bad. Sometimes noisy, but the sense of community is great. We're planning a movie night this Saturday. Sounds fun. I'm in the off-campus housing, but I miss the dorm camaraderie. Well, it was great catching up, Emily. Let me know if you want to grab coffee or study together sometime. Definitely, Alex. Same here. Let's plan something soon. Oh, before I forget, have you seen the latest art installation near the library? It's so creative. No, not yet. I've been meaning to check it out. Thanks for the heads up. Absolutely. We should go together sometime and maybe grab a bite at that new cafe across the street. Sounds like a plan. I'm always up for exploring new places. Just let me know when you're free. Will do, Alex. Looking forward to it. 13. Disease and Health Disease and Health Vocabulary Hi, Bob. How are you feeling today? You look a bit pale. Hi, Alice. I'm not feeling well. I have a pain in my chest and I feel weak. Oh, no. That sounds serious. Have you checked your blood pressure? Yes, I have. It's very high. I think I need to see a doctor. You should. High blood pressure can lead to many complications, such as stroke or heart attack. I know. I'm worried about that. Do you know any good doctors nearby? Well, there is a clinic near the pharmacy. They have a nurse and a doctor who can help you. Do you think they can squeeze me in today? I don't have an appointment. I think so. They usually accept walk-in patients. But you might have to wait for a while. That's okay. 
I don't mind waiting. I just want to get better. I hope you do. Let me know how it goes, okay? Sure. Thanks for your concern, Alice. You're very kind. You're welcome, Bob. Take care. Hi, Alice. I'm back from the clinic. Hi, Bob. How did it go? What did the doctor say? Well, he said I have a heart condition. He did some tests, like an ECG and a Holter monitor. He also took some blood samples for genetic counseling. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That must be scary. It is. He said I might need surgery to fix my heart. He referred me to a cardiologist who specializes in radiology. Surgery? That sounds serious. Are you scared? A little bit. But the doctor said it's a common procedure and it has a high success rate. He said I'll be fine after the surgery and some rehabilitation. That's good to hear. Rehabilitation is very important. You'll probably need some physiotherapy to help you recover. Yes, he mentioned that. He also gave me some medication to lower my blood pressure and prevent blood clots. He said I have to take them every day for a month. That's good. You should follow his instructions and take your medication regularly. Don't skip any doses. I won't. I want to get better as soon as possible. I'm glad to hear that. You have a lot of resilience, Bob. You're very brave. Thank you, Alice. You're very supportive. I appreciate your friendship. You're welcome, Bob. I'm here for you. If you need anything, just let me know. Hi. Bob. It's been a month since your surgery. How are you feeling now? Hi, Alice. I'm feeling much better. Thank you for asking. That's great. I'm happy for you. How was the surgery? It was not too bad. The doctor was very skilled and the nurse was very caring. They made me feel comfortable and safe. That's good. Did you have any complications or side effects? No, not really. The surgery went smoothly and I didn't have any infections or bleeding. The only thing was that I had a rash on my arm where they injected me with the anesthesia. Oh, that's not too bad. Did it go away? Yes. It did. The doctor gave me some cream to apply on it and it healed in a few days. That's good. How about your rehabilitation? How is that going? It's going well. I've been doing some physiotherapy exercises every day. They help me improve my strength and mobility. I can walk and climb stairs without any problems now. That's amazing. You're making great progress, Bob. I'm proud of you. Thank you, Alice. You're very encouraging. I couldn't have done it without you. You're welcome, Bob. You're very determined. You deserve all the credit. Hi, Bob. How are you doing today? You look very happy. Hi, Alice. I'm doing great. I just came back from the doctor's office. Oh, really? What did he say? He said I'm fully recovered. He said my heart is healthy and strong. He said I don't need any more medication or physiotherapy. Wow, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Bob. 
You did it. Thank you, Alice. I'm so happy. I feel like a new person. You are a new person, Bob. You're healthier and happier than ever. You have a new lease on life. I do. I'm very grateful for this second chance. I want to make the most of it. That's good. What are your plans for the future? Well, I want to take better care of myself. I want to eat healthier, exercise more, and practice good hygiene. I want to prevent any future illnesses. That's smart. Prevention is better than cure. You should also try some alternative medicine, like homeopathy or holistic healing. They might help you boost your wellness and immunity. That's a good idea. I'll look into that. Do you have any recommendations? Well, I know a good homeopath who can give you some remedies for your ailments. He can also give you some inoculations for immunization. He's very experienced and trustworthy. That sounds interesting. Can you give me his contact details? Sure. Here you go. His name is Dr. Smith and his number is 5551234. You can call him anytime and make an appointment. Thank you, Alice. I'll do that. Maybe he can help me with my malaise. You're welcome, Bob. I hope he can. Malaise is a common symptom of stress and anxiety. You should try to relax and enjoy life more. I will. You're right. Life is too short to be stressed and anxious. I want to be happy and peaceful. That's the spirit, Bob. You have a positive attitude. That's very important for your health and happiness. Thank you, Alice. You're very wise. You always give me good advice. You're welcome, Bob. You're very humble. You always listen to me. Thank you, Alice. You're very sweet. You always compliment me. You're welcome, Bob. You're very charming. You always make me smile. 14. Apartment Location Hi Bob, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Hi Anne, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, it's been a long time. How are things with you? Well, not so great, to be honest. I'm having some trouble with my rental apartment. The landlord is raising the rent again and I can't afford it. Oh, no. That's awful. Have you tried looking for another place? I have, but it's not easy. The housing market is crazy these days. Everything is either too expensive or too pokey. I know what you mean. I've been trying to get on the property ladder for years, but I can't save enough for a deposit. Yeah, it's so frustrating. I feel like we're drifting apart from our dreams of having our own homes. You hit the nail on the head. It's like we're stuck in a loop of paying rent and never owning anything. Do you think we could ever stretch to it? Maybe if we cut down on some expenses or find a better paying job. Maybe, but it's not that simple. There are so many other factors to consider, like interest rates, taxes, maintenance, etc. I guess you're right. Maybe we should just accept our fate and stop worrying about it. 
Or maybe we should try something different. Like sofa surfing or house sharing. Sofa surfing? What's that? It's when you stay with different friends or relatives for a short period of time, sleeping on their sofas or spare beds. That sounds like a hassle. How do you manage your belongings and your privacy? Well, you have to live out of a bag and be up close and personal with your hosts. But it's a cheap and flexible way to live. You get to see different places and meet new people. Hmm, I don't think that's for me. I like having my own space and routine. What about house sharing? That's when you share a house or a flat with other people, splitting the rent and the bills. It's more stable and comfortable than sofa surfing, but you still have to deal with other people's habits and personalities. That sounds more appealing. Do you have any experience with that? Actually, yes. I've been house sharing for the last six months and I love it. Really? How did you find it? Well, I was browsing online and I saw an ad for a room in a nice flat. It was in a good location and the price was reasonable. I decided to bite the bullet and contact the owner. And how did it go? It went very well. The owner was a friendly guy who was looking for a roommate. He showed me the flat and it was perfect. It was spacious, bright, and well furnished. The room was a bit boxy, but it had everything I needed. I decided to take it on the spot. Wow, that sounds like a turn up for the books. You were lucky to find such a good deal. I know right? I was chuffed to bits. I moved in the next week and I've been living there ever since. How are your flatmates? Do you get along with them? They're great. There are three of them, Christopher, David, and Emiliano. They're all friendly, respectful, and fun. We have a lot in common and we often hang out together. We watch movies, play games, cook meals, etc. It's like having a second family. That sounds amazing. I'm happy for you. You really landed on your feet. Thanks. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. It's changed my life for the better. Maybe I should try house sharing too. Do you know if there are any rooms available in your flat or nearby? Actually, yes. There is a room that will be vacant soon. One of my flatmates, Emiliano, is moving out. He got a job offer in another city and he's going down that road. Really? That's interesting. Can you tell me more about the room and the flat? Sure. The room is similar to mine, but it has a balcony. The flat is on the third floor of a modern building. It has four bedrooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, a living room, and a terrace. It's in a nice neighborhood, close to shops, parks, and public transport. The rent is 600 euros per month, plus utilities. That sounds perfect. Can I see it? Of course. I can arrange a viewing for you. When are you free? How about tomorrow evening? That works for me. I'll text you the address and the time. I'm sure you'll like it. Thanks Bob, you're very kind. I appreciate your help. No problem Anne, I'm glad to help. 
I hope you find what you're looking for. Me too. Well, I guess we should wrap it up. It's getting late and I have to go. Okay, Anne, it was nice talking to you. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, Bob, it was nice catching up with you. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, Anne, take care. 15 at school. Hi, I'm Alice. I'm new here. What's your name? Hi, Alice. I'm Bob. Welcome to our high school. Thank you. I'm a bit nervous. It's a big step from primary school to high school. Don't worry, you'll get used to it. Have you got your uniform sorted? Yes, I have. I'm wearing a skirt, a white shirt, a green tie and a green blazer. What about you? I'm wearing the same, except for the skirt. I'm wearing trousers instead. I see. Do you like the uniform? It's all right, I guess. It's better than what we had back in the day. We had to wear hats and gloves too. Really? That sounds awful. Yeah, it was. They've done away with that now, thankfully. So, what year are you in? I'm in year 11. That means I'm doing my GCSEs this year. What are GCSEs? They are exams that you take at the end of year 11. They cover different subjects that you choose from a list of compulsory courses and optional courses. What subjects are you doing? I'm doing English, Maths, Science, History, Geography, French, Art and Music. Wow, that's a lot. How do you manage? Well, it's not easy. I have to study a lot and do a lot of homework. I also have to keep a diary of all my assignments and deadlines. That sounds stressful. Do you have any fun at school? Of course, I do. I have some great friends and we have a lot of fun together. We also go on school trips sometimes. Last year, we went to London for a big day out. We visited the Tower of London, the British Museum and the London Eye. It was amazing. That sounds awesome. I hope I can go on a school trip too. I'm sure you will. What year are you in? I'm in year 7. That means I'm starting high school this year. Oh, I see. How do you feel about that? I'm excited, but also a bit scared. I don't know anyone here and I don't know what to expect. Well, you don't have to worry. Everyone is very friendly here and the teachers are very nice. They will help you with anything you need. That's good to hear. Thank you for being so kind to me. You're welcome. Do you need any help with your school supplies? Yes, please. I don't know where to get them. No problem. I can show you where the school shop is. They sell everything you need, like textbooks, pencils, pens, erasers, pencil cases, rulers, folders and more. That would be great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Come on, let's go. The shop is this way. Okay, let's go. Wow, this shop has everything. Look at all these books and stationery. Yeah, 
It's pretty impressive. What do you need to buy? Well, I need some textbooks for my subjects, a pencil case, some pencils, pens, erasers, a ruler, a folder and a diary. Okay, let's see. What subjects are you doing? I'm doing English, maths, science, French, Spanish, art, music and PE. That's a nice combination. Which one is your favorite? I think I like art the most. I love drawing and painting. What about you? I like music the best. I play the guitar and the piano. I also like singing. That's cool. Do you have a band? Yeah, I do. We're called the Rockers. We play rock and pop songs. We sometimes perform at school events. That sounds fun. I'd love to hear you play sometime. Sure, I'll let you know when we have a gig. Maybe you can join us too. Do you play any instruments? No, I don't. But I like listening to music. I like pop and rap songs. Nice. Who are your favorite artists? I like Taylor Swift and Drake. They have catchy songs and good lyrics. Who are yours? I like Ed Sheeran and Eminem. They have amazing voices and skills. I agree. They are very talented. So, which subject do you dislike the most? I think I dislike maths the most. I find it boring and hard. I don't. Like numbers and equations. What about you? I don't like science very much. I find it confusing and complicated. I don't like experiments and formulas. I see. Well, maybe we can help each other out. I'm good at science and you're good at art. We can teach each other some tips and tricks. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you for offering to help me. You're welcome. Thank you for accepting my offer. So, how are your teachers and classmates? They are nice, I guess. I haven't really talked to them much. I'm a bit shy and nervous. Don't be. They are all very friendly and helpful. They will make you feel welcome and comfortable. Really? That's good to know. Do you have any advice on how to make friends? Well, you can start by joining some clubs and activities that interest you. You can meet people who share your hobbies and passions. You can also talk to people who sit next to you in class or at lunch. You can ask them questions about themselves or the school. You can also compliment them on something they do or wear. You can also invite them to hang out with you after school or on weekends. You can go to the cinema, the park, the mall, or the library. You can also play games, watch movies, listen to music or read books together. Wow, that's a lot of suggestions. Thank you for giving me some ideas. You're welcome. I'm sure you'll make a lot of friends in no time. You're a very nice and interesting person. Thank you. You're very nice and interesting too. You're the first friend I've made here. Really? I'm honored. You're the first friend I've made in year seven. Really? I'm surprised. You're so popular and cool. Well, thank you. But I'm not that popular or cool. 
I'm just a normal guy who likes music and hates maths. Well, I think you're awesome. And I'm glad we met. Me too. I think we have a lot in common. And I'm happy we met. Me too. I think we're going to be great friends. Me too. I think we're going to have a lot of fun together. Me too. I think we're going to enjoy high school together. Me too. I think we're going to learn a lot from each other. Me too. I think we're going to support each other through everything. Me too. I think we're going to be friends for life. Me too. I think we're going to be the best of friends. Well, I think we've bought everything we need. Thank you for helping me with my school supplies. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me help you. It was fun. It was. I enjoyed shopping with you. Goodbye. 16 Money Hello Anna, today we are going to talk about money and banking. Do you know what money is? Yes, it's what you use to buy things. That's right. And do you know what currency is? Is it the type of money you use in different countries? Yes, that's correct. For example, in France we use euros, but in the United States they use dollars. Oh, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. And do you know what a banknote is? No, I don't. What is it? A banknote is a piece of paper with a number on it that shows how much money it is worth. For example, this is a 10 euro banknote, and this is a $20 banknote. Wow, they look different. Yes, they do. And do you know what a cash point or an ATM is? Is it a machine where you can get money from your bank account? Yes, that's right. You need a card and a code to use it. Do you want to see how it works? Yes, please. Okay, let's go to the nearest one. And do you know what an account is? No, I don't. What is it? An account is where you keep your money in the bank. You can have different types of accounts for different purposes. For example, do you know what a current account is? Is it the account that you use for everyday transactions, like paying bills or buying things? Yes, that's correct. You can use your card or your checkbook to access your money from this account. And do you know what a balance is? No, I don't. What is it? A balance is how much money you have in your account. You can check your balance at the ATM, online, or on your bank statement. And do you know what a checkbook is? Is it a book with pieces of paper that you can use to pay someone instead of using cash? Yes, that's right. You have to write the amount, the date, and your signature on the paper and then give it to the person you want to pay. The money will be taken from your account later. And do you know what to borrow means? No, I don't. What does it mean? To borrow means to take money from someone and promise to give it back later. You can borrow money from your friends, your family, or the bank. But you have to be careful because sometimes you have to pay extra money when you borrow money. And do you know what a branch is? Is it a place where you can go to the bank and talk to a person who works there? Yes, 
That's correct. You can ask them questions, open or close an account, deposit or withdraw money, or apply for a loan. And do you know what a cash deposit is? Is it when you put money into your account at the bank? Yes, that's right. You can use a machine or a cashier to do it. And do you know what to take out or to withdraw money means? No, I don't. What does it mean? To take out or to withdraw money means to get money from your account at the bank or at the ATM. You can use your card or your checkbook to do it. And do you know what a transfer is? Is it when you send money from your account to another account? Yes, that's correct. You can do it online, by phone, or at the bank. You need to know the name and the number of the account you want to send money to. And do you know what a debit card and a credit card are? No, I don't. What are they? A debit card is a card that you can use to pay for things with the money from your account. The money will be taken from your account immediately. A credit card is a card that you can use to pay for things with the money that the bank lends you. The money will be taken from your account later, but you have to pay interest on it. And do you know what to be in debt means? Is it when you owe money to someone or to the bank? Yes, that's right. It can happen when you borrow money or use a credit card and you don't pay it back on time. It can cause you problems, so you should avoid it. And do you know what a loan is? No, I don't. What is it? A loan is when you borrow money from the bank and agree to pay it back with interest. You can use a loan to buy something expensive, like a car or a house. But you have to be careful, because if you don't pay it back, the bank can take your car or your house away. And do you know what interest rate is? Is it the percentage of extra money that you have to pay back when you borrow money? Yes, that's correct. For example, if you borrow 100 euros with a 10% interest rate, you have to pay back 110 euros. The higher the interest rate, the more money you have to pay back. And do you know what a mortgage is? No, I don't. What is it? A mortgage is a special type of loan that you use to buy a house or an apartment. You have to pay it back over a long period of time, usually 20 or 30 years. The house or the apartment is the guarantee for the loan, so if you don't pay it back, the bank can take it away. And do you know what an overdraft is? Is it when you spend more money than you have in your account? Yes, that's right. It can happen when you use your card or your checkbook and you don't have enough money to cover the payment. It can cause you fees and penalties, so you should avoid it. And do you know what to save up means? Is it when you keep some money aside for something that you want to buy or do in the future? Yes, that's correct. For example, you can save up for a vacation, a bike, or a video game. Saving up is a good habit, because it helps you to manage your money better. And do you know what savings are? Is it the money that you have saved up? Yes, that's right. You can keep your savings in your account, or in a special account called a savings account. A savings account usually pays you interest on your money, so you can earn more money by saving. And do you know what a bank statement is? No, I don't. What is it? A bank statement is a document that shows all the transactions that you have made with your account. 
It shows the date, the amount, and the description of each transaction. It also shows your balance and any fees or charges that you have to pay. You can get your bank statement online, by mail, or at the bank. And do you know what bookkeeping is? Is it when you record all the money that you earn and spend? Yes, that's correct. It helps you to keep track of your finances and to plan your budget. You can use a notebook, a spreadsheet, or a software to do it. And do you know what an accountant is? Is it a person who does bookkeeping for you or for a business? Yes, that's right. They can also help you with taxes, audits, or financial advice. They are experts in money and numbers. And do you know what a share is? No, I don't. What is it? A share is a part of a company that you can buy or sell. When you buy a share, you become a shareholder, which means that you own a part of the company. You can earn money from your shares if the company makes a profit, or if the price of the shares goes up. And do you know what a shareholder is? Is it a person who owns some shares of a company? Yes, that's correct. They have the right to vote on some decisions of the company and to receive dividends, which are payments from the company's profits. They also have the risk of losing money if the company makes a loss or if the price of the shares goes down. And do you know what overheads are? No, I don't. What are they? Overheads are the money that a business has to spend on things like rent, electricity, or salaries. They are the costs that are not directly related to the products or services that the business sells. And do you know what losses are? Is it when a business spends more money than it earns? Yes, that's correct. A business makes a loss when its revenues are lower than its costs. It can happen when the demand for its products or services is low, or when the competition is too strong. And do you know what to issue shares means? No, I don't. What does it mean? To issue shares means to sell some of the company's shares to the public for the first time. It is a way for the company to raise money and to expand its business. It is also called an initial public offering or IPO. And do you know what a fine is? Is it the money that you have to pay when you break a rule or a law? Yes, that's right. A fine is a penalty that you have to pay when you do something wrong or illegal. For example, you can get a fine for speeding, parking illegally, or littering. And do you know what a grant is? Is it the money that you get from the government or an organization for a specific purpose, like studying or doing research? Yes, that's correct. A grant is a type of financial aid that you don't have to pay back. You can apply for a grant if you meet certain criteria or requirements. And do you know what a window is? Is it a glass opening in a wall that lets light and air in? Yes, that's right. But in banking, a window can also mean a period of time when you can do something, like withdraw money or transfer funds. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Yes, it is. And do you know what a cashier is? Is it a person who works at a shop or a restaurant and takes your money when you pay for something? Yes, that's right. A cashier is a person who works at the cash desk and handles the transactions. And do you know what the cash desk is? Is it the place where the cashier works and where you pay for your purchases? Yes, that's correct.
The cash desk is where you can pay with cash, card, or check. And do you know what a bargain is? Is it something that you buy for a very low price or a very good deal? Yes, that's right. A bargain is something that you buy for less than its usual or normal price. You can find bargains at sales, discounts, or auctions. And do you know what to barter means? No, I don't. What does it mean? To barter means to exchange goods or services with someone without using money. For example, you can barter your old books for someone else's clothes, or your skills for someone else's help. And do you know what a bill is? Is it a piece of paper that shows how much money you have to pay for something, like a meal or a service? Yes, that's right. A bill is a document that shows the amount and the details of the payment. You can pay your bill with cash, card, or check. And do you know what to be broke means? Is it when you have no money left? Yes, that's right. To be broke means to have no money or to be in a very bad financial situation. It can happen when you spend more than you earn or when you have a lot of debts. And do you know what to charge means? Is it when you ask someone to pay a certain amount of money for something that you sell or provide? Yes, that's correct. To charge means to set a price for something that you offer or deliver. For example, you can charge 10 euros for a haircut or 50 euros for a painting. And do you know what the charge is? Is it the amount of money that you have to pay for something that you buy or use? Yes, that's right. The charge is the price that you have to pay for a product or a service. For example, the charge for a movie ticket is 8 euros, or the charge for a phone call is 0.15 euros per minute. And do you know what to deposit or to pay in means? Is it when you put money into your account at the bank or at the ATM? Yes, that's right. To deposit or to pay in means to add money to your account. You can do it with cash, check, or transfer. And do you know what counterfeit money is? No, I don't. What is it? Counterfeit money is fake money that looks like real money but has no value. It is illegal to make, use, or accept counterfeit money. You should be careful not to get fooled by counterfeit money, because you can get in trouble. Okay, I will remember that. Thank you for teaching me all these words about money and banking. You are very good teachers. You are very welcome, Anna. You are a very good student. Well done, Anna. You are a very smart and talented child. I'm very proud of you. Me too. 17. Shopping Part 2 Hi, Bob. Do you want to go shopping with me today? Sure, Alice. Where do you want to go? How about the shopping mall near the station? They have a lot of stores and apartments there. Okay, sounds good. Let's go. At the shopping mall. Wow, look at that display. It's so colorful and attractive. Yeah, it's for the new perfume from Chanel. Do you want to try it? No, thanks. I can't afford it. It's too expensive for me. Me neither. Let's go to the grocery store instead. I need to buy some bread and milk. Okay, sure. 
I'll go with you. At the grocery store. Bob, can you help me find the bakery section? I want to buy some croissants. Sure, Alice. It's in aisle 5, next to the dairy products. Thanks, Bob. You're so helpful. No problem, Alice. You're very kind. Look, they have a special offer on croissants. Buy one, get one free. What a bargain. Wow, that's great. Let's get some. Okay, let's go to the cash register and pay. At the cash register. Hello, how are you today? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm good, thanks. Do you have a loyalty card? Yes, I do. Here it is. Thank you. You have earned 10 points. You can use them to get a voucher for your next purchase. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Your total is 15 euros. How would you like to pay? In cash, please. Here's a 20 euro banknote. Thank you. Here's your receipt and your change. You have 5 euros in coins. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you for shopping with us. Outside the grocery store. Bob, do you want to go to the drugstore with me? I need to buy some shampoo and toothpaste. Sure, Alice. Let's go. At the drugstore. Bob, can you help me find the shampoo section? I want to buy a new brand that I saw on TV. Sure, Alice. It's over there, next to the cosmetics. Thanks, Bob. You're so smart. No problem, Alice. You're very sweet. Look, they have a display of the new shampoo. It says it's made with natural ingredients, and it's good for your hair. Yeah, it looks nice. Do you want to buy it? Yes, I do. But it's a bit pricey. It's 12 euros for a bottle. Well, you can use your voucher from the grocery store. It will give you a 10% discount. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Thanks, Bob. You're a lifesaver. No problem, Alice. You're very welcome. Okay, let's go to the counter and pay. At the counter. Hello, welcome to the drugstore. How can I help you? Hi, I want to buy this shampoo, please. Okay, sure. Do you have a coupon or a voucher? Yes, I do. Here it is. Thank you. This voucher gives you a 10% discount on your purchase. That's very good. Yes, it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Your total is 10.80 euros. How would you like to pay? By check, please. Here it is. Thank you. Do you have your ID card with you? Yes, I do. Here it is. Thank you. Everything is in order. Here's your receipt and your warranty card. This shampoo has a one-year warranty. If you have any problem with it, you can bring it back and we will replace it or refund you. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. 
You're very welcome. Thank you for shopping with us. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Outside the drugstore. Bob, do you want to go to the outlet with me? They have a lot of clothes and shoes at wholesale prices. Sure, Alice. Let's go. At the outlet. Bob, can you help me find the sales section? I want to buy a new dress for the party. Sure, Alice. It's over there, next to the accessories. Thanks, Bob. You're so nice. No problem, Alice. You're very lovely. Look, they have a lot of dresses on sale. They are 50% off. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. Do you see anything you like? Yes, I do. I like this red dress. It's very elegant and chic. Yeah, it is. Do you want to try it on? Yes, I do. Where is the fitting room? It's over there, next to the cashier. Thanks, Bob. You're so helpful. No problem, Alice. You're very charming. I'll be right back. Alice goes to the fitting room and tries on the dress. Bob, how do I look? Wow, Alice. You look stunning. That dress fits you perfectly. Thank you, Bob. You're so sweet. No problem, Alice. You're very beautiful. I love this dress. I'm going to buy it. Okay, let's go to the cashier and pay. At the cashier. Hello, welcome to the outlet. How can I help you? Hi, I want to buy this dress, please. Okay, sure. That's a lovely dress. It's on sale for 25 euros. That's a great deal. Yes, it is. Thank you. You're welcome. How would you like to pay? By credit card, please. Here it is. Thank you. Do you have a loyalty card? No, I don't. Can I get one? Sure, you can. It's free and easy. You just need to fill out this form and you will get a card that gives you benefits such as discounts, free shipping, and rewards. Okay, sure. I'll fill out the form. Thank you. Here's your card and your receipt. This dress has a 30-day return policy. If you change your mind, you can bring it back and get a refund or an exchange. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for shopping with us. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Outside the outlet. Bob, do you want to go to the bookstore with me? I need to buy a new book for my English class. Sure, Alice. Let's go. At the bookstore. Bob, can you help me find the book I need? It's called The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Sure, Alice. It's over there, in the classics section. Thanks, Bob. You're so clever. No problem, Alice. You're very smart. They are all very interesting. Yeah, they are. Do you want to browse for a while? 
Yes, I do. Maybe I'll find something else I like. Okay, sure. I'll browse with you. Okay, let's go. They browse the books for a while. Bob, look at this book. It's called The Art of Shopping by Mary Smith. It's about how to shop smartly and save money. Wow, that sounds interesting. Do you want to buy it? Yes, I do. It's only 10 euros. That's a bargain. Okay, let's buy it. Okay, let's go to the cashier and pay. At the cashier. Hello, welcome to the bookstore. How can I help you? Hi, I want to buy these two books, please. Okay, sure. These are two very good books. You have a good taste. Thank you. You're very kind. You're welcome. Your total is 35 euros. How would you like to pay? By debit card, please. Here it is. Thank you. Do you have a membership card? No, I don't. Can I get one? Sure, you can. It's free and easy. You just need to fill out this form and you will get a card that gives you benefits such as discounts, free shipping, and rewards. Okay, sure. I'll fill out the form. Thank you. Here's your card and your receipt. These books have a 30-day return policy. If you change your mind, you can bring them back and get a refund or an exchange. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for shopping with us. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Outside the bookstore. Bob, I think we've done enough shopping for today. Do you want to go home? Sure, Alice. Let's go. Okay, let's go. They walk to the bus stop. Bob, I had a lot of fun today. Thank you for coming with me. Me too, Alice. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. You're a great friend. You're a great friend too. Bye, Bob. See you tomorrow. Bye, Alice. See you tomorrow. 18 at the restaurant. Welcome to our restaurant. We're open around the clock. Please, let me take your coat to the cloakroom. Thank you. I've heard great things about your organic, farm-to-table meals. That's correct. We pride ourselves on the quality of our ingredients. Here's your cutlery and napkin. Would you like to start with some appetizers? I'm spoiled for choice. Everything looks delicious. I think I'll give it a whirl and try the surf and turf. Excellent choice. It's a hearty dish with a flavor that will make your mouth water. Would you like a beverage to go with it? Yes, please. Could you pour me a glass of your house red? Of course. And for your main course. Is there a menu or is it just a la carte? We have both options available. You can choose from our menu or order a la carte. I might plump for a fish dish. Is it spicy? 
It has a bit of a kick, but we can adjust the dressing to your liking. It comes with a side order of baked vegetables. Sounds perfect. I'll chip in for that. Great. Your meal will be prepared in our oven and served on our finest china plates. Enjoy your meal. Thank you. I can't wait to try it. After the meal. I hope everything was to your satisfaction. Here is your bill. Everything was wonderful, thank you. I'll take the bill to go. I'm glad to hear that. We like to wipe the slate clean after each guest to ensure the best experience. Have a great day. You too, thank you. Before you leave, would you like to try our complimentary dessert? It's a slice of our famous apple pie, baked in our traditional oven. That sounds delightful. I'd love to give it a whirl. Excellent. I'll have it brought out to you. In the meantime, feel free to relax and enjoy your beverage. Thank you. This restaurant really is top-notch. Even the silver cutlery is impressive. We strive to provide a quality experience for our guests. I'm glad you're enjoying your time here. After dessert. That was delicious. The flavor was just right, not too sweet. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Our chef has a special recipe for the apple pie. Would you like a takeaway box for the leftovers? Yes, please. And could you clear the table? I think we're done here. Of course. I'll be right back with your takeaway box. Thank you. I must say, the service here is excellent. You've really chipped in to make this a memorable meal. We're always here to serve. Thank you for your kind words. Here's your takeaway box. We hope to see you again soon. I'll definitely be back. Thank you for everything. You're welcome. Have a great day. By the way, we have a sommelier on staff who can help you choose a wine that suits your palate. We have a wide range of wines from various appellations. Each one has a unique aroma, body and bouquet. That sounds interesting. I'm not a connoisseur, but I do enjoy a good wine. Our sommelier can guide you. Whether you prefer a blend or a single varietal, something with acidity, or a wine that has undergone aeration, we have it all. We also offer cellar tours where you can learn about the aging process. I'd love to check that out next time. Thanks for the suggestion. It's my pleasure. We look forward to seeing you again. 19 The Weather Good morning. Have you seen the weather forecast today? They say it's going to be a scorcher. Yes, I heard. It was sweltering yesterday too. I was sweating buckets all day. Indeed. This heat wave is intense. I hope we don't have a drought or a hosepipe ban. True. But you know what they say, after rain comes fair weather. Dot. That's right. But it seems like it only snows once in a blue moon here. Well, there's no bad weather, there are just bad clothes. So, we should be prepared for any climate changes. Absolutely. Speaking of which, 
Did you know that a warm November is the sign of a bad winter? I didn't know that. But I do know that, the higher the clouds, the better the weather. Dot. Interesting. I guess we should keep an eye on the cloudiness and atmospheric pressure then. Yes, and also the wind velocity and direction. It can tell us a lot about the upcoming weather. True. And let's not forget about solar radiation and water vapor. They play a huge role in our climate. Absolutely. And remember, if you see a rainbow at noon, more rain soon. Dot. I'll keep that in mind. Stay safe and take care of yourself in this weather. You too. Let's hope for the best. Oh, look outside. It's brass monkeys. I think I'll have to scrape my windscreen before I leave. Yes, and it's blowing a gale. I hope it doesn't turn into a blizzard. I hope so too. Last time, the snow has drifted and caused a lot of problems. That's true. And now, it's chucking it down. I hope this doesn't cause any floods. Me too. But at least, it blows the cobwebs away. That's always a silver lining. That's a positive way to look at it. Let's stay tuned to the weather forecast for the coming days. Absolutely. And remember, if you see a rainbow at noon, more rain soon. I'll keep that in mind. Also, did you notice the overcast sky? It might drizzle later. Yes, and the humidity is quite high today. We might even experience a thunderstorm. True. And the wind chill is quite strong. It's making the temperature feel much colder. Indeed. And the air pressure is dropping too. We might have a tropical storm soon. Let's hope not. But it's always better to be prepared. Stay safe. Absolutely. And with the fog setting in, visibility is getting low. It's a real pea super out there. Yes, and the sleet is making the road slippery. It's a good day to stay indoors and enjoy a hot cup of tea. Definitely. And with the hail coming down, it's not safe to be outside. Better to stay warm and cozy inside. Agreed. And let's not forget the frost. It's going to be a cold night. Yes, and the smog is quite heavy too. It's important to take care of our health in such conditions. Absolutely. And with the snowfall, it's going to be a white Christmas. That's true. And with the risk of mudslides and avalanches, it's important to stay alert and safe. Definitely. And let's not forget the risk of earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. It's always better to be prepared. Absolutely. Stay safe and take care. Speaking of weather, have you ever wondered how different the climates are across various continents? Yes, it's quite fascinating. For instance, Asia has the highest and lowest temperatures recorded on Earth. It can be sweltering in the deserts and freezing in Siberia. That's true. And in Africa, the climate varies from tropical rainforests in the Congo to the hot desert climate in the Sahara where droughts and famines are common. Absolutely. And let's not forget Australia, known for its heat waves and bushfires. But it also has temperate climates in the south. Indeed. Moving on to Europe, the climate is mostly temperate, but it can be quite diverse from the Mediterranean to the Arctic. Yes, and in North America, 
you have everything from Arctic weather in northern Canada to tropical in the Caribbean. The continent is also known for its tornadoes and hurricanes. That's right. And South America has a range of climates too, from the tropical rainforests of the Amazon to the cold winds of Patagonia. And finally, Antarctica, the coldest continent on Earth, is known for its blizzards and incredibly low temperatures. It's amazing how diverse our planet is. It's a reminder of how important it is to understand and protect our various climates. Absolutely. Every climate has its unique characteristics and challenges. It's up to us to adapt and mitigate any negative impacts. 20 Family I was just looking at our family tree and thinking about our ancestry. That's interesting. It's amazing to think about our lineage and all our descendants. Indeed. And it's not just about blood relations. Our family connections include our in-laws and godparents too. True. And let's not forget about our step-family and those who we've adopted into our family. Absolutely. Our kinship ties are strong. Even though we've got a houseful, it's our domestic bliss. Yes, and even though there's some sibling rivalry and we've had our share of family feuds, at the end of the day, blood is thicker than water. That's right. And despite the generation gap, we all come together for festive gatherings like wedding anniversaries and baby showers. Indeed. And even when someone's laid up, or has been in the wars a bit, we rally around them. Yes, like when Dad was at his wit's end dealing with all the problems. We all stepped in to help because he had a lot on his plate. Absolutely. And even though every family has their skeletons in the closet, we've learned to deal with our issues and not become estranged. That's true. And we honor our ancestors and remember our line of descent. Our ancestral home is filled with family heirlooms that remind us of our history. Yes, and we also respect the roles of the patriarch or matriarch in our family. And we acknowledge the challenges of being a single parent, or the guardian of twins or triplets. Absolutely. Our family is a mix of nuclear and extended family members, and we value both our maternal and paternal sides equally. That's beautifully said. Our family is indeed special. And speaking of progeny, it's amazing to see how each generation brings something new to the family. Each child, each new member adds to our rich tapestry. That's so true. And even when we face family strife, it's those very connections that help us navigate through the tough times. Our kinship is our strength. Indeed. And it's not just about the present. Our ancestors have left us a legacy that we carry forward. Our line of descent is a testament to their resilience and love. Absolutely. And it's up to us to pass on that legacy to our progeny. To ensure that the ties that bind us remain strong and unbroken. Yes, and part of that is acknowledging and dealing with the skeletons in the closet. Every family has them, and it's how we deal with them that defines us. True. And it's important to remember that no matter what, at the end of the day, blood is thicker than water. Our family is always there for us. That's right. And it's during those festive gatherings that we really feel that sense of belonging. Be it a baptism, a wedding anniversary, or a baby shower, these events bring us closer. 
Indeed. And even when there's a family feud, or when someone becomes estranged, we strive to bring them back into the fold. Because that's what family does. Absolutely. And when it comes to inheritance, it's not just about material possessions. It's about inheriting values, traditions, and memories. So true. And as we add branches to our family tree, we ensure that those values and traditions continue to thrive in the younger generation. Yes, and that's the beauty of family. It's a circle of love and life that keeps going. And no matter where we go, we always carry a piece of our family with us. Beautifully said. Here's to family, the compass that guides us, and the inspiration to reach great heights. And speaking of progeny, it's amazing to see how each generation brings something new to the family. Each child, each new member adds to our rich tapestry. That's so true. And even when we face family strife, it's those very connections that help us navigate through the tough times. Our kinship is our strength. Speaking of inheritance, it's not just about the material possessions we pass down. It's also about the values, the traditions, and the love that we inherit from our family. That's so true. Our ancestors have left us a rich legacy that goes beyond physical assets. It's a legacy of resilience, of courage, and of love. Indeed. And it's our responsibility to carry that legacy forward. To ensure that our progeny understands the value of family and the strength of our kinship. Absolutely. And it's during our festive gatherings that we really get to celebrate our family and our shared history. Be it a wedding anniversary, a baptism, or a baby shower, these events bring us closer together. Yes. And even when we face family strife, it's those very connections that help us navigate through the tough times. Our family connections are our strength. True. And it's important to remember that no matter what, at the end of the day, blood is thicker than water. Our family is always there for us. That's right. And it's not just about the present. Our ancestors have left us a legacy that we carry forward. Our line of descent is a testament to their resilience and love. Absolutely. And it's up to us to pass on that legacy to our progeny. To ensure that the ties that bind us remain strong and unbroken. Yes, and part of that is acknowledging and dealing with the skeletons in the closet. Every family has them, and it's how we deal with them that defines us. True. And it's during those times of trouble that we often find we've got a houseful. Because in times of need, you can always count on your family to be there. Absolutely. And when it comes to inheritance, it's not just about material possessions. It's about inheriting values, traditions, and memories. So true. And as we add branches to our family tree, we ensure that those values and traditions continue to thrive in the younger generation. Yes, and that's the beauty of family. It's a circle of love and life that keeps going. And no matter where we go, we always carry a piece of our family with us. Beautifully said. Here's to family, the compass that guides us, and the inspiration to reach great heights. Indeed. And even when someone's laid up or has been in the wars a bit, we rally around them. We take care of each other. That's so true. And even when someone is at their wit's end, like my poor dad last week, we step in to help. 
Because that's what family does. Absolutely. Family is not just an important thing, it's everything. 21. Christmas. How do you usually spend your Christmas holidays? Happy New Year. I usually spend Christmas Eve with my family. We have a tradition of lighting a candle and placing it in the fireplace. It's a symbol of warmth and togetherness. That sounds lovely. Do you also have a Christmas tree? Yes, we do. We decorate it with gold and holly berries. And of course, there's the angel at the top. It's not Christmas without the Christmas tree. Absolutely. And what about the Christmas meal? Oh, it's a huge blowout. It's turkey and all the trimmings, pigs in blankets, and a stodgy dessert. We even have eggnog and some bubbly. Sounds delicious. Do you also exchange Christmas presents? Yes, we do. After the meal, Father Christmas comes down the chimney and leaves Christmas presents under the tree. The kids love it. That's wonderful. And what about the religious aspect of Christmas? Well, we're Christians, so we celebrate the birth of Jesus. We have a manger scene with figures of Jesus, Joseph, and the Magi. We also sing Christmas carols. The Christmas music's on a loop. That sounds like a perfect Christmas day. Wishing you a prosperous new year and all the best for the coming year. Thank you. Season's greetings to you too. Do you send out Christmas cards to your friends and family? Yes, I do. I usually start preparing them during Advent. I think it's a nice way to show people that you're thinking of them. That's a nice tradition. Do you also bake a Christmas cake? Yes, we do. We usually bake it a few weeks before Christmas and then enjoy it on Christmas Day. It's a rich, fruity cake that's a real treat. Sounds delicious. And what about Boxing Day? Do you celebrate that as well? Yes, we do. It's a day for relaxing and enjoying leftovers from the Christmas meal. It's also a day for giving. Traditionally, it was when employers would give their staff a Christmas box, hence the name Boxing Day. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, it sounds like you have a wonderful Christmas planned. Enjoy the festivities. Thank you. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas too. Speaking of Christmas presents, do you have any special traditions around gift giving? Yes, we do. We usually place our Christmas presents under the Christmas tree and open them on Christmas Day. It's always a joy to see the surprise and happiness on everyone's faces. That sounds wonderful. Do you usually know what you're getting or is it a surprise? It's usually a surprise. We all try to find thoughtful gifts that the others will love. It's not about the cost of the gift, but the thought that goes into it. I completely agree. The best gifts are the ones that show you really know and care about the other person. Exactly. And sometimes, the best gifts aren't things at all. They could be experiences, or even just spending time together. That's so true. After all, Christmas is about being with the people you love. Absolutely. And that's the greatest gift of all. I've heard that many people travel during the Christmas holidays to reunite with their families. Do you have family members who do that? 
Yes, we do. Some of our family members live in different cities, or even different countries. They usually try to come home for Christmas. It's a time when we can all be together. That sounds lovely. It must be nice to have everyone together for the holidays. It really is. There's something special about having the whole family under one roof, sharing meals, exchanging gifts, and creating memories. It's one of the things I love most about Christmas. I can imagine. And I suppose it makes the goodbyes at the end of the holidays a little bittersweet. Yes, it does. But we always look forward to the next time we'll be together. And of course, there's always the promise of next Christmas. Do you have any special games or activities that you organize with your family during the Christmas Eve? Yes, we do. We have a few traditions that make the evening more fun and interactive. One of them is the Christmas cracker game. Oh, I've heard about that. Isn't it the one where two people pull on either end of a cracker and it makes a small bang? Yes, that's the one. Inside the cracker, there's usually a small toy or trinket, the joke, and a paper crown. The person who ends up with the larger part of the cracker gets to keep the contents. It's a lot of fun. That sounds like a blast. Do you have any other games? We also play a game called charades. We write down different Christmas-related phrases or movie titles on slips of paper and take turns acting them out. It's a great way to get everyone laughing and involved. I love charades. It's such a fun game. Any other activities? Well, after dinner and games, we usually gather around the fireplace with some eggnog and read Christmas stories. It's a cozy and heartwarming way to end the evening. That sounds like a perfect Christmas Eve. Your family really knows how to celebrate. 20 Suka New Year. Hey Sarah, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? I'm not sure yet. I was thinking of going to a party. How about you? I'm planning on going to the city center to watch the fireworks display. It's supposed to be amazing. That sounds like fun. What time does it start? The countdown starts at 11.59 p.m. and the fireworks go off at midnight. That's perfect. We can toast to the new year with some champagne. Great idea. And we can sing Auld Lang Syne too. Yes, that's a tradition. Do you have any New Year's resolutions? Yes, I want to learn a new language this year. How about you? I want to travel more and explore new cultures. That's a great resolution. I hope we both have good luck and prosperity in the new year. Me too. Speaking of luck, I heard that eating black-eyed peas on New Year's Day brings good luck. Really? I've never heard of that superstition before. It's a southern tradition in the United States. They also eat hot pin john, which is a dish made with black-eyed peas and rice. Interesting. In Italy, they eat cochino con lenticchi and zampone on New Year's Day for good luck. And in Japan, they eat osechi and toshikoshi soba. Wow, I didn't know that. I guess every culture has its own New Year's customs. Yes, it's fascinating. 
Do you have any other traditions or customs for New Year's Day? Well, I always wear red underwear for good luck. Really? That's funny. I've never heard of that one before. It's a tradition in some countries. And have you ever heard of first footing? No, what's that? It's a Scottish tradition where the first person to enter your house after midnight on New Year's Eve brings good luck for the coming year. That's interesting. I'll have to try that one. Thanks for telling me about it. Speaking of customs, did you know that many cultures have their own unique traditions for celebrating the new year? Really? Like what? Well, in Spain, people attempt to eat 12 grapes during the 12 strokes of midnight. If they succeed before the chimes stop, they will have good luck for all 12 months of the coming year. That's interesting. In the southern U.S., black-eyed peas and pork are eaten on New Year's Day to foretell good fortune. Yes, and in Scotland, they hold bonfire ceremonies where people parade while swinging giant fireballs on poles. Wow, that sounds intense. In Italy, they wear red underwear for good luck. And in Japan, they eat Tashikoshi soba, which is a type of noodle soup, on New Year's Eve to symbolize longevity. That's fascinating. I had no idea there were so many different customs around the world. Yes, it's amazing how diverse our world is. Do you have any other customs to share? Well, in Ecuador, it is tradition to burn effigies of famous people to destroy bad juju from the past year and start fresh. And in Denmark, they throw plates and glasses against each other's front doors to banish bad spirits. It's so interesting to learn about these customs. I hope we can experience some of them someday. Me too. Happy New Year, Sarah. Happy New Year, John. 23. Artificial Intelligence Hi Jane, have you heard about the latest advancements in artificial intelligence, AI? Yes, I have. AI has been around for a while now, but it's only recently that it has started to make significant progress. Absolutely. One of the most exciting areas of AI is deep learning. It's a subset of machine learning that uses convolutional neural networks to analyze and classify data. That's right. And big data is a crucial component of deep learning. The more data we have, the better the algorithms can learn. Speaking of algorithms, have you heard of backpropagation? It's a technique used to train artificial neural networks. Yes, I have. It's a supervised learning algorithm that helps the network learn from its mistakes. Another interesting area of AI is clustering. It's a technique used to group similar data points together. And data mining is another important area of AI. It's the process of discovering patterns in large datasets. Right. And decision trees are often used in data mining. They're a type of algorithm that helps us make decisions based on data. Another area of AI that's gaining popularity is chatbots. They're intelligent agents that can simulate human conversation. That's true. And sentiment analysis is a technique used to determine the emotional tone of a conversation. And knowledge representation is another important area of AI. 
It's the process of representing knowledge in a way that computers can understand. And probabilistic reasoning is a technique used to make decisions based on probabilities. Another area of AI that's gaining popularity is robotics. Robots are becoming more intelligent and are being used in a variety of applications. That's right. And swarm intelligence is a technique used to model the behavior of social insects like ants and bees. And unsupervised learning is a type of machine learning where the algorithm learns from unlabeled data. And weak AI is a type of AI that's designed to perform a specific task, like playing chess. While strong AI is a type of AI that's designed to be as intelligent as a human. Well, that's quite a lot of AI vocabulary we've covered. It's amazing how much progress has been made in this field. Yes, it is. And it's exciting to think about what the future holds for AI. There are several areas where AI is expected to make significant progress in the next decade. That's interesting. What are some of those areas? One area is robotics. Robots are becoming more intelligent and are being used in a variety of applications. For example, they can be used in manufacturing to perform repetitive tasks. That's true. And predictive analytics is another area where AI is expected to make significant progress. It's the process of using data, statistical algorithms, and machine learning techniques to identify the likelihood of future outcomes based on historical data. Another area is natural language processing. It's the process of using computers to understand and interpret human language. This technology is already being used in chatbots and virtual assistants. And image recognition is another area where AI is making significant progress. It's the process of using computers to identify objects within digital images. That's right. And reinforcement learning is another area where AI is expected to make significant progress. It's a type of machine learning where an algorithm learns to make decisions by trial and error. Another area is cognitive computing. It's the process of using computers to simulate human thought processes. This technology is already being used in expert systems and decision support systems. And swarm intelligence is another area where AI is making significant progress. It's the process of modeling the behavior of social insects like ants and bees. That's quite a lot of areas where AI is expected to make significant progress. It's exciting to think about what the future holds for this technology. Yes, it is. However, there are also several risks and problems linked to AI. Some of the biggest risks of AI include Automation spurred job loss Deep fakes Privacy violations Algorithmic bias caused by bad data Socioeconomic inequality Market volatility Weapons automatization Uncontrollable self-aware AI these are just some of the risks associated with AI. As AI continues to advance, it's important to be aware of these risks and work to mitigate them. That's a good point, Jane. It's important to consider both the benefits and risks of AI. Absolutely. Thanks for the chat, John. You're welcome, Jane. It was great talking to you. 24.
Global Inequalities Hi Jane, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. How about you? I'm good too. I was reading about global inequalities and it's quite alarming. Yes, it is. There are glaring inequalities in wealth, income, and access to education across the world. Exactly. The disparity between the rich and poor is increasing every day. We need to bridge the gap and tackle these inequalities. I agree. Discrimination and marginalization are also major issues that need to be addressed. There is inequality of opportunity for underprivileged people, especially when it comes to gender and racial disparities. That's true. We need to raise awareness about these issues and work towards social justice. A better distribution of wealth and social mobility can help bridge the social divide. Absolutely. We also need to ensure that everyone has access to basic necessities like food, housing and healthcare. Health disparities and child labor are major problems in many parts of the world. Yes, and we need to tackle economic oppression and social exclusion. A living wage and minimum wage laws can help reduce poverty and debt cycles. And let's not forget about globalization. It has brought many benefits, but it has also led to exploitation and human rights violations in some countries. You're right. We need to be aware of these issues and work towards a more just and equitable world. Agreed. It's a big challenge, but we can make a difference if we work together. I think we also need to address housing inequality. Many people around the world don't have access to safe and affordable housing. Yes, that's a major issue. It's especially difficult for people living in urban areas where housing prices are skyrocketing. And let's not forget about food insecurity. Many people don't have access to nutritious food, which can lead to serious health problems. Absolutely. We need to work towards a more equitable distribution of resources, so that everyone has access to the basic necessities of life. That's right. And we need to raise inheritance taxes to reduce wealth disparity and promote social mobility. And we need to tackle child labor and ensure that everyone has access to education. Educational disparities are a major problem in many parts of the world. Yes, and we need to address the debt cycle that keeps many people trapped in poverty. A living wage and minimum wage laws can help break this cycle. And we need to work towards social justice for all. Human rights violations and exploitation are still major problems in many countries. You're absolutely right. We need to be aware of these issues and work towards a more just and equitable world. Agreed. It's a big challenge, but we can make a difference if we work together. Definitely. Let's do our part to make the world a better place. But what do you think about globalization? I think one of the biggest challenges of globalization is the impact it has on local cultures. When people from different parts of the world interact, it can lead to a loss of cultural identity. That's true. But I also think that globalization can help preserve local cultures by promoting cultural exchange and understanding. That's a good point. But we also need to be aware of the negative effects of globalization, such as the exploitation of workers in developing countries. Yes, that's a major issue. 
We need to work towards fair trade policies that protect workers' rights and ensure that everyone benefits from globalization. Absolutely. And we need to address the environmental impact of globalization as well. The increased production and transportation of goods has led to greater pollution and climate change. That's right. We need to work towards sustainable development and reduce our carbon footprint. And we need to ensure that everyone has access to the benefits of globalization, not just the wealthy and powerful. Agreed. We need to work towards a more just and equitable world, where everyone has access to basic necessities and opportunities for a better life. Definitely. Let's do our part to make the world a better place. Sounds good to me. Thanks for the conversation, John. Thank you, Jane. It was great talking to you. 25 British Monarchy Hey, I'm trying to understand the British Monarchy. Can you help? Sure. The monarch, who is currently the king, is the sovereign of the United Kingdom. The monarchy is seen as a symbol of continuity, because it has been around for centuries. What's the role of the king or queen? The king or queen is the head of state. They perform ceremonial duties and represent the country. However, the power to make decisions lies with the elected government. This is known as sovereignty. I've heard about the abdication crisis. What's that? The abdication crisis happened when King Edward VIII gave up, or abdicated, the throne to marry Wallace Simpson, a divorced American. This was a big scandal at the time. What happens when a monarch dies or abdicates? The heir to the throne becomes the new monarch, in a process called accession to the throne. They then ascend the throne during a coronation ceremony. What's the peerage? The peerage is a system of titles in the UK, part of the aristocracy. It includes ranks like Duke, Marquis, Earl, Baron and their female equivalents Duchess, Marchioness, Countess and Baroness. And what's Buckingham Palace? Buckingham Palace is the London residence of the monarch. It's where the changing of the guards takes place, a popular tourist attraction. What's the Queen's speech? The Queen's speech is given at the opening of Parliament. It outlines the government's plans for the year. But remember, it's written by the government, not the Queen. So, the monarchy is mostly symbolic. Yes, it's symbolic and regal, but it's also a part of British history and culture. Some people are monarchists who support the monarchy, while others think the UK should be a republic. I've heard about Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Can you tell me more about their romance? Sure. Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer's relationship was a significant part of British royal history. They first met in 1977, when Diana was just 16 years old and Charles was nearly 13 years her senior. Their relationship was described as a whirlwind romance. When did they get married? They got married on July 29, 1981 at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The event was watched by an estimated 750 million people around the world. It was dubbed the Wedding of the Century, and their vows served as a symbol of hope for the British monarchy and its continuation. But their marriage didn't last, right? Correct. Their marriage was rocky, and they separated in December 1992. 
Their divorce was finalized in 1996, just one year before Princess Diana's tragic death. That sounds so sad. Yes, it was a time of great controversy and romance. Despite the challenges, they both continued to fulfill their royal duties. Prince Charles is now the king, and their sons, Princes William and Harry, are important figures in the monarchy. It's interesting how personal lives can have such a public impact. Indeed, the British monarchy is not just about the crown and the throne, but also about the people who hold these positions and their personal lives. It's a blend of public duty and private life, which often captures the world's attention. Who is next in line for the throne after King Charles III? After King Charles III, the line of succession turns to his older son, Prince William. Prince William is now the Prince of Wales. He is the eldest son of King Charles and Diana. And who is after Prince William? Prince William's children are next in line. First is Prince George, followed by Princess Charlotte, and then Prince Louis. They are followed by Prince Harry and his children, Archie and Lilibet. So, the line of succession is all planned out. Yes, the line of succession is determined by birthright. However, it can change with births, deaths, and changes in law. But as of now, that's the order. It's fascinating how it's all structured. Indeed, the British monarchy has a long history and tradition. It's a complex system, but it's also a part of the UK's identity. What are the main problems that King Charles III will face? King Charles III faces several challenges. First, he has to define what it means to be a modern monarch. The societies over which the British monarchy rules have changed significantly over the 70 years of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Charles will have to make new choices about what it means to be a modern monarch. Can you give me an example? Sure, one of the challenges is the relationship between the sovereign, nations, and people. For instance, Queen Elizabeth was not just the Queen of the United Kingdom. She was also the Queen of many other countries like Jamaica, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Canada, Tuvalu, Australia, and more. All these countries are now subjects of the new king. Whether all these countries accept the new king in the same manner, in which they accepted his mother remains to be seen. What other challenges does he face? Another challenge is his health. King Charles III has been diagnosed with cancer. While he plans to continue fulfilling his state duties, he will step back from public appearances. This adds more pressure on the British monarchy, which is still evolving after the 70-year reign of the late Queen Elizabeth II. It sounds like he has a lot on his plate. Indeed, being a king in the modern era is not easy. There are many ways he can fail, and it's not even clear what success looks like. But as the king, Charles III will have to navigate these challenges and lead the monarchy into the future. 26. Olympic Games Hi Jane, are you excited for the upcoming Olympic Games in Paris? Hi John, yes I am very excited. I love watching different sports and cheering for my country. Me too. Do you know when the Olympic Games started and what they were like in ancient times? Well, I know they originated in ancient Greece and were held in honor of Zeus, the king of the gods. 
They were part of a religious festival that lasted for several days. That's right. The first recorded Olympic Games were in 776 BC, but they probably existed much earlier. They were held every four years in Olympia, a sacred site in the Peloponnese. Only men, boys and unmarried girls were allowed to attend. Married women were barred and could be thrown off a mountain if they sneaked in. Wow, that's harsh. What kind of sports did they have back then? They had running, wrestling, boxing, chariot racing, discus, javelin, long jump, and a pentathlon, which combined five events. The winners received olive wreaths and were celebrated as heroes. That sounds amazing. How did the Olympic Games end in ancient times? They ended in 393 AD, when the Roman Emperor Theodosius I banned all pagan festivals, including the Olympics. He wanted to promote Christianity as the official religion of the empire. That's sad. How did the Olympic Games come back in modern times? They came back in 1896, thanks to a French nobleman named Pierre de Coubertin, who founded the International Olympic Committee, IOC. He wanted to revive the spirit of the ancient Olympics and promote peace and friendship among nations through sports. That's noble. How have the Olympic Games changed since then? They have changed a lot. They now include winter sports, Paralympic sports, youth sports, and many more events and disciplines. They also have a torch relay, an opening ceremony, a closing ceremony, medals, mascots, and symbols. They are open to all athletes, regardless of their gender, race, or status. They are also influenced by politics, media, and commercialism. That's true. There are many controversies and challenges facing the Olympic Games today. But I still think they are a wonderful celebration of human achievement and diversity. Don't you agree? I agree. I think the Olympic Games are a great way to learn about different cultures and values, and to appreciate the beauty and joy of sports. I can't wait to watch them and see who will make history this year. Me neither. Let's go and get ready for the opening ceremony. I heard it will be spectacular. By the way, do you know that the Olympic Games have been a source of many scandals and controversies throughout history? Really? Like what? Well, for example, the 1936 Olympics in Berlin were used by Nazi Germany to promote their propaganda and racial ideology. Many Jewish athletes were excluded or persecuted by the Nazis. That's horrible. How did the world react to that? Some countries and individuals boycotted the games or protested against the Nazi regime. For instance, Jesse Owens, a black American athlete, won four gold medals and defied Hitler's claim of Aryan supremacy. Wow, that's impressive. What about other boycotts or protests? There have been many. For example, in 1968, two American sprinters raised their fists in a black power salute on the podium to protest against racial discrimination in the U.S. In 1980 and 1984, the U.S. and the Soviet Union led boycotts of each other's games because of the Cold War. I see. That's very political. What about other controversies that are not related to politics? There are also controversies related to doping, cheating, corruption, or human rights. For example, in 2002, there was a scandal in figure skating, 
where a French judge admitted to being pressured to vote for the Russian pair over the Canadian pair. In 2016, there was a massive doping scandal involving Russian athletes, who were accused of using banned substances and tampering with samples. In 2024, there are concerns about the environmental and social impact of the games in Paris, such as gentrification, homelessness, and security. That's a lot of issues. How do you feel about them? I feel conflicted. On one hand, I think the Olympic Games are supposed to be a celebration of sportsmanship, excellence, and peace. On the other hand, I think they also reflect the realities and problems of the world we live in. I hope that the Olympic spirit can overcome the challenges and inspire positive change. I agree with you. I think the Olympic Games are not perfect, but they are still worth watching and supporting. I think they can show us the best and the worst of humanity and challenge us to do better. Well said. I'm glad we can have this conversation. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with me. Thank you too. I learned a lot from you. Let's enjoy the games together. 27 Phrasal Verb Get Hi Jane, how are you today? I'm fine, thanks. How about you? I'm good. I just got back from my trip to Italy. Wow, that sounds amazing. How did you get around there? I mostly used public transportation. It was very convenient and cheap. Did you see any famous landmarks? Yes, I visited the Colosseum, the Vatican, and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I'm so jealous. I've always wanted to go to Italy. Maybe you can go someday. You just need to get ahead in your work and save some money. That's easier said than done. I have so much to do, and so little time. Don't worry, you can do it. You just need to get up early and get after your tasks. Thanks for the encouragement, John. You're such a good friend. You're welcome, Jane. I'm glad we get along so well. Me too. By the way, can I borrow your English book? I left mine at home. Sure, no problem. But can you please return it tomorrow? I need to get it back before the test. Of course, I promise. I won't get away with keeping your book. Thanks, Jane. I appreciate it. Here you go. Thank you, John. You're very kind. Hey, do you want to join me for lunch? Sure, why not? Let's go. Okay, great. Let's get out of here then. Wait, before we go, can I ask you something? Sure, what is it? Do you remember that guy who was rude to me at the party last week? Yeah, I do. He was such a jerk. Well, I found out his name and where he works. Really? How did you do that? I have my ways. Anyway, I want to get back at him for what he did. Do you want to help me? Hum, I don't know, John. That sounds risky. What do you have in mind? Nothing too serious. Just a little prank to make him look silly. Like what? Well, I was thinking of sending him a fake email from his boss, telling him to wear a clown costume to work tomorrow. What? 
that's hilarious. But also mean. Come on, Jane. It's just a joke. He deserves it. I guess he does. But what if he finds out it was you? He won't. I'll use a fake email address and a VPN. He'll never trace it back to me. Okay, fine. I'll help you. But only if you promise to stop after this. I promise. Thank you, Jane. You're the best. You're welcome, John. But you owe me one. Deal. Now let's go and have some fun. Okay, let's go. But first, can you explain to me how to use a VPN? Sure, I'll try to get it across to you. It's not that hard. Okay, thanks. I hope you're right. Trust me, I am. Come on, let's go. 28. Driving a car. Jane, have you ever been in an accident while driving? Oh, yes. Once, I was driving downtown, and suddenly a car crashed into my bumper. It left a dent, and I had to call an ambulance for the other driver. It was quite a mess. Yikes. Accidents can be scary. Did you have to change lanes quickly to avoid the collision? No, unfortunately, I couldn't react in time. But luckily, the fire truck arrived promptly to help. They even checked my engine for any leaks. Speaking of engines, have you ever had a breakdown on the highway? I once had to back up my car to the nearest car park when my engine started acting up. Yes, I remember that. It's essential to check your mileage regularly and get your oil changed. Otherwise, you might end up with a costly repair at the dealership. True. And don't forget to use your blinker when changing lanes. I got a ticket once for not signaling properly. Oh, I've been there too. And make sure your license plate is visible. I once got pulled over for having a dirty one. Right. And keep an eye out for toll booths on the bridge. I almost missed one last week. Absolutely. And always buckle up when you're in the back seat. Safety first. Agreed. And don't forget to check your tire pressure. A flat tire can ruin your day. So many things to remember while driving. But it's essential to follow all the directions to stay safe on the road. Definitely. And keep your windshield clean for better visibility. Accidents happen, but we can do our best to prevent them. Wise words, John. Let's accelerate towards safer driving. Jane, have you ever noticed any differences between men and women when it comes to driving? Oh, definitely. There are some stereotypes, but let's discuss. For one, I've heard that men tend to be more aggressive drivers. They might accelerate quickly and change lanes frequently. True, but women often pay more attention to details. They're better at following directions and checking their mirrors. I guess it balances out. Agreed. And speaking of directions, men might hesitate to ask for them. They'd rather drive around lost than stop and ask someone. Ha. You're right. 
but women are more likely to pull over and ask for help. Safety first, I suppose. And parking. Men sometimes struggle with parallel parking. They'll try to fit into tight spaces even if it takes forever. Guilty as charged. But women are more patient. They'll find a better spot or take their time adjusting. Now, let's talk about multitasking. Women are pros at it. They can adjust the radio, sip coffee, and still focus on the road. Meanwhile, men might get distracted by flashy billboards or sports scores on the radio. We're not as good at multitasking. And let's not forget about road rage. Men might get angrier behind the wheel, while women tend to stay calmer. You're right. But both genders should remember to use their blinkers. It's a universal rule. Absolutely. And whether you're a man or a woman, safety and courtesy matter most. Let's all drive responsibly. Jane. Have you ever noticed how driving customs vary so much from country to country? It's fascinating. Absolutely, John. It's like a whole new set of rules and habits every time you cross a border. What stands out to you the most? Well, for one, the side of the road we drive on. In the UK, Australia, and Japan, it's the left side. But in the US, Canada, and Germany, it's the right side. And don't forget about yielding and stopping. In some countries, like the UK and Germany, drivers give way to vehicles on the right. But in others, it's different. True. And then there are those quirky customs, like how in India and South Africa, they drive on the left due to their British colonial history. And let's not even get started on roundabouts. Each country seems to have its own approach. Right. It's like a global driving adventure. Buckle up, Jane. 29 Negotiation Good morning, Jane. How are you today? Good morning, John. I'm well, thank you. I've been meaning to talk to you about my career development. Of course, Jane. What's on your mind? I've been considering my future within the company. I've set my sights on transitioning into the role of an IT architect. Interesting choice, Jane. However, that role requires a significant amount of specialized skills and experience. What makes you think you're ready for it? I understand it's a challenging role, John. But I believe my background in IT and my dedication to continuous learning make me a strong candidate. Plus, I've identified areas where I need to develop further, and I'm committed to doing whatever it takes to succeed. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Jane. However, we have limited resources for training and development. Why should we invest in you for this particular role? Investing in my development as an IT architect would benefit the company as well. With my technical skills and strategic thinking, I could contribute to solving complex IT challenges and driving innovation within our organization. It's a win-win situation. I see your point, Jane. But we also need to consider the needs of the team and the company as a whole. How do you propose balancing your career goals with the current demands of your role? I understand there are priorities within the team, John. 
That's why I'm willing to be flexible and work on my transition gradually, taking on additional responsibilities as I gain new skills. I believe I can still fulfill my current duties while preparing for the IT architect role. That's a fair approach, Jane. However, we need to ensure that your proposed career path aligns with the long-term goals of the company. How do you see yourself contributing to our strategic objectives as an IT architect? As an IT architect, I would be able to provide valuable insights and recommendations for optimizing our IT infrastructure and systems. By aligning our technology investments with the company's strategic goals, I could help drive growth and competitiveness in the market. I appreciate your vision, Jane. Let's discuss this further in our next meeting, where we can delve into the specifics of your proposed career development plan. In the meantime, I'll need to assess the feasibility and impact of your transition on the team and the company. Thank you. John. I look forward to our continued discussion. I'm confident that with your support, we can find a mutually beneficial solution that meets both my career aspirations and the company's needs. Agreed, Jane. Let's reconvene soon to explore our options and chart a path forward. 30. Business Dialogues Can you please send me the latest report? Sure, I'll send it to you right away. When is the next team meeting scheduled? It's scheduled for tomorrow at 10 a.m. Could you give me an update on the client's feedback? Unfortunately, we haven't received any feedback yet. Could you book a meeting room for us? Of course. I'll take care of it right away. Do you need assistance with setting up the projector? Yes, that would be great, thank you. Are you available for a quick meeting later today? I'm afraid I have another commitment, but I'm available tomorrow. Could you please proofread this document for me? Certainly, I'll look over it right away. When is the deadline for this project? The deadline is next Friday. Can you please take notes during the meeting? Of course, I'll make sure to jot down all the key points. Would you mind sending me your feedback by tomorrow? Not at all, I'll make sure to send it to you before the end of the day. Could you please proofread this email before I send it? Sure, I'll take a quick look at it for you. Can you assist me with preparing the agenda for the meeting? Of course, I'll work on drafting it right away. Do you know how to troubleshoot printer issues? Yes, I can help you troubleshoot it. Could you please double check the calculations in this spreadsheet? Certainly, I'll review them thoroughly. Would you mind proofreading this report for me? Sure, I'll check it over for you. Can you give me a hand with setting up the projector? Of course, I'll come right over to assist you. Do you have any suggestions for improving our customer service? Yes, I think implementing a customer feedback system could be beneficial. Are you available for a quick meeting this afternoon? Yes, I can make time for that. Could you please update the team on the project status? Sure, I'll send out an email with the latest updates. Would you like some feedback on your presentation? Yes, I would appreciate any feedback you have. Do you have any updates on the budget for this quarter? Yes, I can provide you with the latest figures. 
Could you please schedule a conference call for next week? Sure, I'll set up the conference call and send out invites. Would you mind forwarding me the meeting minutes from yesterday? Of course, I'll forward them to you right away. Can you double check the deadline for this task? Sure, I'll confirm the deadline and get back to you. Do you need any assistance with preparing the agenda for the meeting? No, I've got it covered, but thanks for offering. Is there anything urgent that needs my attention? Yes, we need to resolve the issue with the server ASAP. Would you like me to take notes during the meeting? Yes, that would be helpful. Thank you. Do you have any suggestions for improving our workflow? Yes, I think implementing a new project management tool could help. Could you provide an update on the status of the current project? Of course, the project is progressing well and we're on track to meet the deadline. Can you schedule a meeting for next week? Yes, I'll arrange a meeting and send out invites to everyone. Are you available for a quick discussion? Sure, I can chat briefly. What's on your mind? Would you like me to send out the meeting agenda? Yes, please. It would be helpful to review before the meeting. Can you provide an update on the budget allocation? Certainly, I'll review the latest figures and get back to you. Do you need assistance with preparing the presentation slides? No, thank you. I've already completed them. Are you familiar with the new software update? Yes, I've already familiarized myself with the changes. Can you confirm the meeting time with the client? Yes, I'll send them a confirmation email right away. Would you like me to book the conference room for the team meeting? Yes, please. That would be very helpful. Do you have any dietary restrictions for the office lunch? Yes, I'm vegetarian, so please ensure there are veg options. Could you please forward me the meeting minutes? Of course, I'll send them over right away. Are you available for a quick call to discuss the project updates? Yes. I can take the call now. Let's discuss the updates. Could you provide an update on the status of the pending tasks? Sure, I'll compile a list and send it to you shortly. Would you like me to schedule the team meeting for next week? Yes, please. Let's set it up for Tuesday afternoon. Can you provide an update on the budget allocation for the project? Certainly, I'll review the figures and get back to you by tomorrow. Could you please share the progress report for the current quarter? Absolutely, I'll compile the report and send it across by the end of the day. Do you need assistance with preparing the presentation slides? Yes, that would be great. Could you assist with the design aspect? Is there anything urgent that needs my attention? Yes, we have a client call in 15 minutes that you need to join. Can you help me locate the file I was working on yesterday? Of course, let me check my computer. What was the file name? Would you like me to forward this email to the team for discussion? Yes, please do. It's important for everyone to be in the loop. Are you available for a quick meeting later this afternoon? Sorry, I have another commitment at that time. Can we schedule it for tomorrow? Could you please proofread this document before sending it out? 
Certainly, I'll look it over and make any necessary corrections.